Your Majesties, Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am Grand Duke Travis of West Arctica, and it's my And it's, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to MicroCon 2022. For the fourth time since 2015, we meet together in the spirit of friendship, this time here in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. We are 100 brave and slightly crazy souls determined to live life on our own terms, inspired by art, by politics, and by the micronationalists who came before us. MicroCon is an excellent opportunity to reconnect with old friends, to meet new allies, and to figure out if your uniform from the previous MicroCon still fits. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert, mine didn't. <laughs> it's also a chance to be a part of the fellowship of Micronations. Everyone here today is a part of the community of Micronations. By attending events like this, you set yourself apart from the faceless masses who are hiding behind their computer screens. I've attended every MicroCon since 2015, and I continue to be inspired and enriched by my fellow Micronationalists. For example, just yesterday, I learned that the Republic of Soundland has a zip line in their country. Meanwhile, in West Antarctica, we can't seem to get heat or running water. <laughs> Although global warming may be changing that for us. When I founded West Antarctica 20 years ago, I never imagined that, that we would become a leader in the micronational community. Back then, my motivations for creating my own country were based around my ego and self-centeredness. But standing here today in front of all of you, I am, I am both humbled and honored to be your host today. On behalf of myself, the Organizing Committee of West Antarctica, thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming to this event today. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, so we're going to have presentations. Now. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to uh, present here today. It's an honor to be with all of you once again. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. So uh, at last MicroCon in 2019, uh, I wrote an article about the sovereignty of micronations, uh, and I argued that micronations should be at least de facto sovereign, or considered at least, uh, as a matter of fact, sovereign. Uh, since then, I've been working on the conceptual idea of the nature of sovereignty. Essentially, what does it mean to be sovereign or independent? The idea of sovereignty matters because it's how states representing their people interact on a global stage, much like what we're doing here today at MicroCon 2022, interacting on even a micro international stage. In this presentation, I will argue that positive law theory of sovereignty is certainly complex by drawing examples of this complexity from uh, examples of nations around the world. For example, when you consider microstates, that is very small, but yet fully sovereign countries or states around the world, all microstates are legally or de jure sovereign, but they're not necessarily a matter of fact or de facto sovereign. As many microstates depend heavily on allies for survival. Palau, uh, as an example, is in free association uh, with the United States. Nauru has occasionally been referred to as a client state of uh, Australia, without whom Nauru certainly would probably perish. Liechtenstein, although very wealthy, depends on Switzerland as a financial partner. The Vatican City relies on Italy for pretty much everything <clears throat> from utilities such as water and electricity to military, to military defense and education, to prisons and hospitals. Monaco, albeit another very wealthy uh, state, uh, relies on France for military defense. And so all of these examples raise an interesting question. 
What does it mean to be truly solver? What does it mean to be truly independent? Microstates, despite being fully legally sovereign, are not perhaps as free as states like the United States of America, or the People's Republic of China, or the United Kingdom, all of which wield considerable amounts of freedom from uh, dependence on other states for survival. These states, in fact, perhaps go so far as to even hold some power or influence over other states. The United States of America with Palau, the United Kingdom with many of the Commonwealth states, and China with many oceanic countries. Besides these three powerhouse countries, multi-governmental multi organizations such as the United Nations and the European Union hold some political power or influence over other sovereign states. Notably, the states in the Schengen area give up sovereignty over their borders. Many economic decisions and even some internal policies to the power of the European Union. All of these situations that I've mentioned should serve as examples of how the idea of sovereignty is not necessarily clear cut. It's incredibly important to see that de jure or legally sovereign states are not necessarily as sovereign as they might think they are or as they might try to portray they are, especially in the sense that they're not necessarily free from other states the influence of other states, or even some of their own political policies. These sovereign states may be de jure sovereign or legally sovereign, but they're certainly not completely <clears throat> de facto sovereign, or as a matter of fact sovereign. In fact, it can be argued that they're not really all that independent, at least not more so than disputed states, semi-recognized states, or even micronations. If some of one's sovereign decisions are being made by another entity, then they're not really truly sovereign or independent decisions, right? Likewise, if an independent state is dependent on other states for many of its necessities, then that state is not very independent or sovereign. As for micronations, remember, as long as no one actively tries to stop a micronationalist, I argue that the micronationalist is at least de facto, or as a matter of fact, sovereign. No one's stopping us from being here, not being raided, at least not yet, right? <laughs> right? Oh, you know. Uh, so as long as a micronation is de facto or a matter of fact sovereign, it is an independent sovereign state, at least in its own regard, at least in its own right, and maybe should be recognized as such, even if the micronation depends on other entities, large or small. As far as positive law is concerned and should be concerned, in the end, if, a micronation, if micronations are not legally sovereign or de jure, they may at least be, as a matter of fact, sovereign or de facto sovereign, which, as we have seen, is as much or perhaps even more than some micro states can claim. So, although the United States supplies utilities for Malaysia and for Pabasip and for many of us here in the room, and we're very thankful that they haven't shut off the water on us yet. Uh, this, allowing for, this allowing for some form of de facto sovereignty, larger states allow for micronations to exist by not challenging our existence. When they don't show up at our door and ask us to stop, we're acting free, we're acting sovereign. Even though the micronations depend on other sovereign states, other states, such as Liechtenstein, Monaco, and the Vatican City, do so as well. 
larger states allow for microstates to exist by not challenging the microstate's existence. The Italy has yet to invade San Marino, and we're waiting for France to invade Monaco. Rose right? Island. I'm sorry? Italy destroyed Rose Island. They did. And so that's an example of where it doesn't go correctly. Right? We see these are, you all are examples of where it goes well. And unfortunately, there are many examples of where it doesn't go so well for microstates or micronations. And this leads me to my final point that perhaps the definition of sovereignty is a bit less clear than intended. Having supreme and absolute power within its own territory and can decide its own foreign and domestic policies, it is neither subordinate or responsible to any other authority. If that's our definition, that's okay. But even if not all states can do that, microstates or micronations, that's okay. Because the definition allows us to understand the importance of these issues. And so when we consider our great work here at MicroCon 2022, it's not so much about how we rely on other entities, because as a matter of fact, all states depend on other entities. And that's a good thing. In fact, we all depend on each other. We all need each other, and we all need to work together for the common good. Whether you're a macro state, or a micro state, or a micro nation, it's important that we all work together for the common good. And I think that our micronations here at Microcon can serve as a great example for that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, quick uh, note to Travis. This is the Drosai Board of Pollination 2012. <laughs> <laughs> so we recycle. Um, succession planning. This is, I worried about doing this so early in the day simply because I, I'm concerned that this might be a bit of a downer topic because no one really wants to think about what happens <coughs> when you die. <laughs> okay, laughter was really not what I was going to be <laughs> um, And the reason I had been thinking about this is because, and now we all get to get sad, um, our founder, Lars Bilks, uh, passed away on October 3rd of last year. He was killed in a car accident. And this Fortunately, I was prepared for the emergency management side of, of everything, but I wasn't necessarily prepared for the, uh, the probate and the dealing with the assets. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about today is what is, this is hard for me to do, so I'm going to take this. It'll so, come off. Does it come out? He's got pull hard. <laughs> No, no, that's what she said, Joe. <laughs> 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 we were waiting for that. To be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, now I can see what I'm doing, and this is going to work. So, no one wants to receive that call, but when the call comes, what are you going to do? There's two distinct issues that we need to address. One is emergency management and disaster recovery. So, disaster recovery could be anything from a you know, it could be a death, it could be a severe injury, it could be a tornado, it could be a hurricane. It's anything that causes a threat to the things that you need to maintain your micronation and the and all its accoutrement. So we just need to make sure that we can recover things and we can protect them. Now, because of Lars's situation, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lars's situation, he was he was living under there we go. Um, he was living under police protection since 2007, I believe, um, because unrelated to Ladonia and unrelated to Nimis, he had perhaps drawn a cartoon of someone he wasn't supposed to draw a cartoon of, and there were a lot of people that wanted him dead. So we, we always knew that there was a possibility something would happen, which is why I was, I had it in my mind that I need to make sure that the websites are protected because we were under constant bombardment with hack attempts. People would try to get in not only to get at our you know, credit card information and our user information, but to deface the website or just to take it down because they hated him. Um, so it was, this was always kind of something that was going on in my mind. 
distinction. That in. The second thing we're going to deal with, like I said, is the succession of tra and transference of rights. But let's talk about the disaster recovery first. So having a plan and not panicking is priority number one. And how do you how do you make sure you don't panic? Not only do you have a plan, but you've practiced your plan. You've gone through it. It's like a fire drill. Why do you do fire drills in grade school? Because when it's go time, it's go time. Not, oh my God, what do I do? Run around with my hair on fire time. You need to go and you need to stay calm. So we have a plan. The plan needs to be reviewed periodically to make sure that it's still valid. If you have a plan that says, I'm going to go lock down the website, and the website is at ABC Host, and 10 years later, the website is now posted somewhere else, your original plan is no longer good. And that means that when you go to execute your plan, things are gonna get messed up and things are gonna get hacked and everything's going to blow up in your face and it would be very bad. So as I said, like a fire drill in grade school, we practice so that we can execute when it's time without having to think too hard about it. Emergency <coughs> management and disaster recovery also includes having an inventory of all the assets that your micronation has that are necessary to keep it running. So does this mean your Discord server? By the way, how many of you have Discord servers? Are they locked down? Are you protecting them from raids? Because if I hear one more child complain to me, my server was taken over, I will scream. If you properly lock it down and defend it, this won't be an issue. Have good security. Running WordPress is not the end of the world if you have good security. You have to have two-factor authentication set up. You have to make sure that you're not allowing anybody and their grandmother to try to log in. So there's security things that you can do where you can restrict access to specific IP addresses or just to specific countries and eliminate 99% of the script kitties and the random attacks that might be occurring, not necessarily because someone's out to get you, but because they're looking for a soft target. Don't be a soft target. That's going to take care of a lot. Now, if you upset someone, I almost said a bad word, if you upset someone and they are specifically and they're specifically motivated to get you, that's a different ball of wax. And the reason that's a different ball of wax is because they're not going to look for a soft target. They're going to just keep hammering until they make a hole. So that's, if you need help with that, talk to me afterwards. I'll give you some advice. So you need to have your list. You also need to know where all your website hosted accounts are. The, the two-factor authentication is usually tied to a cell phone. You need to know which cell phone authorizes that. You need to know where your bank accounts are. You need to know where everything is sitting and you need to know who's got access to what so that depending on who is the person that gets compromised, you can secure that quickly. Your needs in this area are definitely going to vary, but Anything that would cause the loss of your micronation and the loss of your ability to function needs to be in this inventory. So if the loss of your ability to function is your website, that absolutely has to be addressed. If you have a giant wooden structure on the coast of Sweden and it's going to be a problem if it burns down, <laughs> you, need to have, you need to have a plan for that. Now I can tell you that when Lars, when Lars died, we executed pretty flawlessly and I was rather, you know, I was as happy with the execution as I could be given the circumstances because it was a very stressful time. Um, but we had people actually physically deployed to Nimbus to protect it, to make sure that no one was going to go burn it down. The bombardment on social media was brutal. I had to turn my phone off. It was hundreds of messages, really cruel messages actually, um, per second for days. Um, the hack attempts were ridiculous. I, I, I reduced his user authorization, or his user became unprivileged, which means even if they got into his account, which I really super locked up, they wouldn't have been able to do anything anyway. So there were steps I took within minutes of getting the phone call to make sure that during this time of craziness, that's when bad people will look to take advantage because they're looking for you to be off guard. <coughs> And death is going to do that. So then let's talk about, I don't want to, I mean, this could be an all-day conference, really. <laughs> let's talk about succession and transfer of rights. Real countries don't close up shop when their leader dies. There's a transfer of power. Things continue on, right? What we need to worry about, oh, here. Micronation is more than a collection of symbols or artworks that belong to a single person. This is my opinion. This is not necessarily the opinion of courts around the world. And the reason it's not the opinion of courts around the world is because they don't understand what a micronation is. Anyone, 
you know that saying that any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic to people who don't understand the technology? Micronations are the same way. The courts don't understand what we're doing. So they try to put it in a box that they do understand and then they apply those laws to it. So you need to make sure that you've got structures in place that help guide the courts to do things the way you want them done because if you leave it to the courts to decide, if you leave it to the probate courts to decide what happens to things, nine times out of 10, your assets and the micronational assets are going to be given to somebody in the family, a, a next of kin, that either doesn't want anything to do with the micronation or doesn't understand what to do with it. And everything you worked for is going to go away and there will be no legacy. You know, you want people to remember you. You want, you want it to continue on beyond you. You want it to be bigger than yourself. At least I assume you do. I know there's some micronations that aren't like that, and I'm not talking to you right now. So <laughs> if you have a functioning government, your micronation is going to run more like a business, and you should treat it like a business. Take some steps to make it legally a business in the jurisdiction where you are likely to croak, and things will go smoother for everyone should the, the worst happen but your plans need to reflect your structure. If you are more like a single artwork or a performance piece, construct your plan accordingly. If you're more like a business, construct your plan accordingly. But do some reflection and figure out what's going to be the best format for that. So the things that you need to think about, you think about your physical assets. What are things that you can pick up and touch and move around that are kind of fungible, right? That you need to account for in your documentation. What is your real property? Real property is real estate. If you have real estate, you have to, who's going to inherit it when you die? Is it, you can't just say, I'm leaving it to my micronation because the court is going to say, there's no such thing. And then the court's going to say, since there's no such thing and you're clearly crazy, I'm going to give this to your next of kin. If that's not what you intend to happen, you have to make sure that you spell that out. IP and copyright. So IP is intellectual property. Intellectual property is things like the design of your website, the design of your pins, the design of your coat of arms, the design of anything. Anything you design that's kind of artwork that, that's copyrightable and it's intellectual property and you need to make sure that you specifically inventory that so that you can address it in your will. So, okay, I understand this is tiny so I'm gonna read this to you, but hopefully you guys can get a copy of this so you can have it. You need a written, agreed upon constitution with detailed succession instructions so that your government, assuming it's more than just you, continues running. This is less for the courts and more for your people so your people know what your instructions were as you go forward. Ladonia did have good succession plans written out. It's just that the courts didn't necessarily agree with that part. Um, you need a legally drafted last will and testament in your jurisdiction that specifically and explicitly names each of the assets that you want disposed, you know, distributed. You need to name all of the people that need to be included. If you don't specifically name someone, they are not included. And the default is going to be your next of kin. And if your next of kin is your brother that you hate, congratulations, you just left everything to your brother that you hate. Personal, and I don't hate my brother for that. It's <laughs> my sister. But anyway, <laughs> my mom's here. Please. <laughs> you need. <laughs> she should have been nicer to me. <laughs> A list of all your passwords, accounts, authorization, and access information. You don't want people to have to try to break into things. I mean, it can be done assure you, but uh, you don't want to force that. It's much easier when people have access. And if you have a business entity, your corporate attorney, which you absolutely should have if you have a business entity, will be able to assist you. He'll help you prepare all of the documents for business succession. Business succession is a thing that corporate attorneys do. Rely on your corporate attorney. If you don't have one and you do have a business entity, I strongly encourage you, encourage you to get a real attorney. Not someone who pretends to be an attorney on the internet, but an actual attorney that is willing to, to do the work. The necessary documents, there we go. Okay, plan ahead, make sure you're prepared. We never want the worst to happen. 
but if we're prepared for it, it'll make things easier. So just in case, make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row. And that was my talk. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about the West 2 Space Agency. And in general, I'm going to talk to you about departments or agencies that you have in your country that, that are meaningful, meaningful to the people of your country, meaningful in the general world population, and why those are, are important. And I think uh, my question is, you know, can a, for a space agency, can a small nation have an impact on space study? And the answer is yes, a small nation can, can have an impact on space study. <laughs> West Who has, it's called the West Who Space and Planet Exploration Agency, SPEA or SP. Um, it was developed to promote activities and programs involving science, technology, uh, priorities that support the government of the Republic of West Who. And SEPA directs its resources, which, being a small country, are not huge. You know, and I think that's something we face in micronations. Period. Is you know our activities don't have the budgets and the wherewithal that larger entities have, but they can still be fun and they can still contribute to, in this case, space exploration, space studies, space knowledge. So I'm going to stop just for a minute. This is a, a, a four-minute video um, about the West Who Space Program, so that the, the first minute and a half is related to my talk today. And then after that are about three or four short uh, videos that West Who has put on its YouTube channel, all related to space that the space agencies put out. So you get like a little feel for what what we're doing and what we're about. And I'll talk a little bit more about that after. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it and we'll watch this and see what you think. All right, welcome to the International Space Station. Here's a tour. We're starting right now in Columbus. And if you look on this little iPad right here, as you can see, it's of course the European laboratory. But it's not just European, we also have uh, NASA racks in here, NASA payloads in here too at the same time. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. This is Houston, contact with the test. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three.
three four five five four three two one. End of test. Engine contact Hawaii contact. Hundred percent clean and modulation is go. Roger Hawaii. Read you loud and clear. Also. go through because the, the videos highlight some of the things that we're doing and I want to talk to you about how you can have fun, uh, you can still learn things that are serious about space, about space agencies, and that you can do these things and it's not a super great cost to your country and you can have fun. So um, you saw the astronaut with the, the pad at, at the International Space Station you flying around and it had West Who symbol on it. And one of the sites I like and that I've used to make a few of these videos, many of you are familiar with this, is a group called Fiverr. And you can, it started out for $5, you can get stuff made now, uh, you know, with inflation and everything, uh, you know, they've they upped their prices and things. But, but it is fun, so, you know, I sent them, uh, uh, logo and they put it on you know made the the little commercial video for five or ten dollars um now to real life we found a place where we could buy a patch you know, like the astronauts wear on the international space station and we paid for that and they sent it up to the international space station it took almost a year it uh we did it for our space director to have his, his name on it. And uh, the patch was flown on the International Space Station around the Earth 5,408 times before it was brought back to Earth on a SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. So that was fun. Uh, we could watch the International uh, the SpaceX Dragon come back to Earth. We watched it launch, uh, lock onto the International Space Station, knowing that our little name patch was on it. And then when it was done, we you know presented that to uh, our space director. So it was kind of fun where we're mixing a little bit of quote unquote fantasy with reality. You know where we're we're making some things on Fiverr promoting space, but inserting West too, and then we're actually doing things for real. Um, the weather balloon launch, uh, they have various sizes. Ours wasn't real big. We attached a, a postcard that said West Who. Um, we lived in Southern California, or at least I did at the, the, the time, so it probably ended up in the ocean somewhere, but we were hoping <laughs> that when it came down, Thanks, would, John. Would, 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 <laughs> would find the card and, and mail it back. It could be on top of a map. <laughs> so, um, our astronaut, if I could have him stand, he's in the back, our Vice President, Ron Hall. Uh, he's, 
when you saw Ron on uh, the moon, we, uh, you know, we're planting the West Two flag and looking at the moon relics that are there. I mean, we're a little disappointed uh, that the mainstream media totally ignored this story. And, you know, we thought having an astronaut on the moon, you know, would uh, get a lot of press, but, but it didn't. In real life, uh, Ron and our foreign minister and I, uh, before COVID, traveled through Eastern Europe. And as part of our space activities, Ron took us to, in St. Petersburg, Russia, to um, the Museum of Cosmonautics and Rocket Technology, which has all kinds of information about the Russian space program, which was really cool. And we learned a lot of stuff about that. We saw one of the dogs that the Russians had sent into outer space in the early, uh, late 50s, and he's stuffed now, you know, but um, <laughs> uh, got some pictures. Uh, our foreign minister had, on one of his diplomatic trips was in Hong Kong and visited a, a Chinese um, space and aeronautics museum. And one of the pictures in one of the videos it showed uh, in Russia, they have a uh, cosmonaut's uniform, you know, where you can stick your face through it. And so, you know, we did that in Russia, which was kind of cool. And then Michael, our foreign minister, did that in, in, uh, in China as well. So again, we're getting our uh, pretend being on the moon, fun activities, mixing them with real activities. Uh, we have a website for our space agency. There's a Facebook page for the space agency. There's an Instagram page and, the, and a Twitter account. The, the Twitter account really follows um, actual activities in the, in the space world and we focus on smaller nations. So. Um, when the UAE sent an astronaut to the International Space Station for us, being a smaller country, that's a big deal. Uh, Luxembourg forms a space agency. Or, you know, we focus that on our account. Um, you know, just just different different things like that. Uh, the European Union had um, the very first female astronaut. Uh, just a few weeks ago that did a spacewalk and she's an Italian astronaut and that was the very first time. So again, we reported that on the, the, the West Who um, Twitter account and you know, there's a, a lot of followers and so it's legitimate space news that you can learn from and I think micronations can contribute in that way. Um, there was a, a time I met with um, a NASA astronaut, uh, her last name was Piper, and it was just kind of a coincidence with the town, uh, I was living in Corona, California, and our public library of all things sponsored her to come out um, from NASA and do a program uh, uh, you know, about the um, space agency. And so I was uh, at the time a vice principal in junior high, and we announced it, you know, so our students you know, encouraged them to go and, and meet her, and, and it was really a great activity. And, Free. And again, it promotes space awareness. It encourages young people that might be interested in that, you know, towards those activities. Um, so some of the things that we're involved in that we want to pursue, uh, we would really someday like to launch a microsatellite. And there are a lot of opportunities and there are a lot of different types of microsatellites that you can launch, but one that we think would be feasible for West 2 is um, on a, a low earth orbit rocket and uh, it actually, you know, you send up a small camera and then it takes pictures coming back down. And that's feasible for a micronation financially and, and you can do that. You can hook up with some university groups. There was a picture in here of a pretty large, substantial rocket being launched. And a lot of those are private groups, private, you know, that are space enthusiasts and you can get your country involved in that way. So I encourage you to think of things for your micronation that are of interest to you, that you uh, can contribute to the greater good, and you can involve your citizens. And I think you'll have, it'll make it a fun activity, uh, it'll promote your micronation, and I think you'll just enjoy yourself. So to close, the mission of the West Coast Space Agency is to promote the peaceful use 
in development of space to advance the knowledge of space through science and to ensure that space science and technology provide social and economic benefits to the citizens of West 2. And those are all things that we can achieve and they're things that you can achieve too. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Have you had the opportunity to look around and meet your fellow micronational person? Yes. yes, you did. Because I want to tell you that it is a blessing to be here again. I like that word, again. This is my third time at the microcon, and I know some of you have been here longer than that. My son, the Crown Prince, this is his second time. And we want to say that we are truly, truly blessed to be among such great individuals. I had some things all written down that I just might go in a different order. If you look around, you will see that there are a lot of great minds here. And the members of the media, if this is your first time, I want you to take notice of the people that you see in this room. Micronation may be small in name, but we are big and we are growing. There are a lot of great minds here. I just learned last evening from a member that it is better to live on a houseboat that is motorized than it is to live in a houseboat that has sails on it. I bet you a lot of you might not have known that. <laughs> yes, no, there is a difference. I just wanted to say that uh, thank you to the host, the Grand Duke McHenry, the founder, Queen Anastasia, President Bo, King George, this 2.0, <laughs> and some of the other members. And I also recognize that some of our beloved members that I would have hoped to see and didn't make it. We have uh, His Territorial Highness King Arthur of Homestead, and I recall that Dr. Liss was not able to make it, among other people. But I just wanted to welcome you all here, because you know what? We are not just anybody. People might uh, discount us, or who knows, maybe even look down on us, but we're not just any old body. We are unique members of a community with brilliant, brilliant people who have brilliant ideas. I was listening to <laughs> the Queen of Londonia. I always say that wrong. Did I say it wrong again? No, you said it right. Okay. When she spoke about preparedness in case of tragedy. I was listening to, as we were, talk, uh, the Minister Farr, when he talked about the space programs that his nation is involved in. So there are brilliant minds in this room. What you have to do is tap into it. Go talk to people and find out what's going on in their minds. And we don't have to go, one of the good things about the micronation is that even though you think you're small, we're big, we don't have to go to the macro nations for what we want and what we need. All we have to do is circulate around this room and you're gonna find a lot of what you wanna know, somebody here already knows. Just ask, and I'm not gonna be long up here, but I just wanted to say that, that uh, you are great in your own mind, in your own skin. <laughs> if you look around, you're great just the way you are. You don't really need anyone to tell you you're great. You have to have that attitude that you're already great. And you know, I don't mind telling you. Because I already know that I'm great, not because I'm such a um, self-centered person, but I'm a determined person. And it looks like you guys are determined also. You're determined not to let anyone stop you from what your heart's desire is. I recall the Queen Anastasia once saying that when she's queen, she's being who she wants to be. <laughs> and when I'm being the king of Amazonia, that's who I want to be. And there's no one that's going to stop that. You can't let people discourage you 
from your goal, from your dream. Be who you want to be. And you're going to make out all right. And I just want to encourage you that you guys look good in your skin. You look good in your personalities. Keep on doing that. Continue to march. When I was in the military, we used to say, continue to march. When everybody else was going in one direction, some people were turning to the left, some were turning to the right. A company commander said, continue to march. That meant keep going straight on your path. And I don't, I'm a preacher, so I'm trying not to go on the preacher road. But I can feel it coming on. So, so I'm going to sit down before I say too much. Because if you know, you're doing a holy dance up in here. You know, because I love you all, and I'm, I'm just so thrilled of being here. And I can't wait until the next one pops up, because I'm going to be just as vibrant and just as energetic as I was at the last one. And I want to tell you younger folks who this is your first time here, observe, watch, and learn. There's a lot to observe, a lot to watch, and a lot to learn from those of us who's been around the block a couple times, so to speak. So don't be afraid to come out of your little comfort hole zone and talk to some of these, talk to some of these people who know a lot more than you do. And I want to tell you to keep on coming out and I encourage you to get your mind straight, do what is in your heart, and just keep on coming out and let's keep making this a great place to come. Amen. I wanted to start with my, my, my micronation, the Kingdom of Fergus. We were founded in 2007 and we're not a very ostentatious entity. Um, in fact, uh, the pace at which we developed it sl slowed down considerably for a number of years. I we were founded in 2007. I became engrossed in personal issues. Uh, I was traveling. I lived in China for two years, from 2016 to 2018, which is a place that's not very conducive to micronationalism. As you can probably imagine. Um, when I try to describe uh, the Kingdom of Fergus, the concept, first of all, the, the primary motivation for its founding uh, developed because I was a graduate student at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas, in the history program, and of course I had to write a master's thesis and when it came time to select a subject I didn't want to write about some sort of hackneyed event or subject that had been, been written about by thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people the Civil War World War II the Great Depression something like that everyone has written about these great issues so it occurred to me because from childhood, I had uh, some fascination with the concept of micronations, and it occurred to me to write my thesis on that subject, which is the uh, title of the presentation I'm giving today, What is a Nation? That was the name of, or is the name of my uh, thesis. Uh, Prince Philip uh, sort of preempted some of my uh, the points that I was going to make, and uh, he stated them very eloquently, better than I could. But the the uh, gist of the thesis was to try to explore uh, concepts of nationhood. What, in fact, is a nation? And to, to cut to the chase, after all of the research that I did, it seems to me that there's uh, precious little that's universally agreed upon in regard to what constitutes a nation. Some of the, the things that I might tell you are probably old news. Uh, you're probably aware that there are two basic schools of thought in regard to nationhood and what it entails. There's the constitutive theory and the declarative theory. 
The constitutive theory, of course, uh, posits that uh, the existence of a nation uh, is contingent upon its being recognized by other nations. Most micronationalists, to my knowledge, choose instead to focus on the declarative theory, which uh, only requires uh, a fixed location, population, a government, and the ability to interact with other nations. Still, at the end of the day, when I finished this thesis, the, uh, the situation was murkier than it was when I began. My personal conclusion is that there is no criteria. These are, the, the, the concept of nationhood to me is an artificial construct. Um, and beyond that, it, it probably isn't very comfortable for uh, a lot of us to think of things in these terms. But it uh, comes down to the old expression, might makes right. Um, for example, I mentioned that I lived in China for two years. This was not a place to practice micronationalism. <laughs> I'm not, I don't want anyone to think that I'm criticizing the Chinese people. Almost everyone I met without exception was very gracious very kind to me, but I do, uh, and I know probably uh, in the micronationalist community it's not um, usually advised to take stances on uh, large issues, but I do take exception with the system there. Uh, and I think one of the most valuable aspects of the micronationalist community is uh, in places where this is possible, which happens to be most of North America, Europe, other places as well, is just simply the ability to state this. We are, we are a micronation, and we don't have to worry about the secret police knocking on our door in the middle of the night. In Beijing or Shanghai, this couldn't occur, I guarantee you. And so that's one of, I think, uh, micronationalism and the proclamation of uh, a micronationalist entity is probably the ultimate expression of free speech, which I think is one of the most valuable aspects of it all. Again, returning to the subject of the Kingdom of Fergus, I founded it in connection with the the thesis that I was writing at the time. I thought, well, I might um, have my own. Uh, we haven't, I, my interest has been rekindled uh, recently in the last couple of years, and I hope that we'll, we will become more active than we ever were. But basically, and in keeping with what I said about the value of just declaring uh, your state, your nation, without fear of any punitive measures taken by a, a larger macro-nationalist government. I uh, am reminded of something that uh, His Excellency Kevin Bauer of, of Malasia said once. Uh, Malasia exists because it exists. Uh, and I think that kind of I think that kind of sums up uh, nations in general, whether macro nations, micro nations, or any uh, political entity. If it exists, that's it. That's all. That's all you need. Um, I'm enrolled in Wichita State again in another graduate program, this time in English. And I intend to write yet another thesis on the subject of micronationalism. This is one of, my, in addition to wanting to come here because I had never been to one of these gatherings before, 
I wanted to try to interest the in attendees in uh, contributing material to my thesis. So I have my display there, modest though it may be. I have uh, business cards there with my email address and please feel free to pick one up and contact me. Uh, I'm just beginning this program so it will be some years before it's completed. But uh, for those of you who have ever gone through this process, academically, uh, when, when one writes a, a thesis or a dissertation, um, it's a requirement to have a multitude of what are called primary sources, which would be actual individuals that you know and you interview as opposed to citing various academic works on the subject. So you could be a great help to me uh, if you would contact me and uh, I could include something about your micronations in this uh, forthcoming thesis. I believe that's, uh, that's all. The, the only other thing I would say, uh, I'm very gratified to be here because this is the first time I, opportunity I've had to interact with other micronationalists, even during the course of writing the thesis. Uh, I never met him personally, but um, His Excellency the President of Malaysia was very helpful. Uh, he did some telephone interviews with me and I cited him in the thesis. And the only other micronationalist I met during all this period of time was Ailey Bibi of Oxyblon, if you're familiar with that micronation. I visited Israel and of course I had to go. <laughs> I had to take the taxi about halfway across Israel <laughs> to get to Oxyblon. But this is the first time uh, I'm trying to express my appreciation to you because this is the first time that I had a chance to interact with so many micronationals at the same time. So thank you very much for your attention. So the short version is I bought some land off of eBay in 2005. <laughs> so a bit younger then. Um, the sick about kind of owning a piece of the American West before it was all gone. Um, somebody had described a piece of video art that they had seen where uh, by the E team where they bought some land and you know, in the middle of the desert in Utah, and you can do this at this time. So um, I did that and I went out there and it's quite remote, 50 miles past the last gas station, 15 miles on dirt roads. And then at the time it was three and a half miles walking straight into the desert after that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there was kind of a like, what do I do with it? So. It doesn't, it does, for me it doesn't seem like that long ago, but I guess it kind of was, like it's the Bush era. Um, there is, yeah, a lot of things happening I, politically and with the country where I felt like uh, me as an American or whatever, I felt like what's happening, what our country is doing after 9-11, war, war in Iraq. Um, you know, it's like, is there a way that I could not have this identity or inherit this identity or be born into it? Is there a way that I can kind of formulate it or have a say in um, that type of thing? So that was kind of the initial snowball that I rolled down the kind of proverbial hill. Um, so yeah, I invited some people over, bought a nice piece of parchment, uh, and so, and declared Zakistan a sovereign nation. So it was a kind of tongue in cheek thing at the outset. Um, some people, I think it's gotten more serious. Some people say that maybe the joke's gotten more elaborate. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I kind of, there's a kind of whole history of the kind of projects I've done. So like over the course of several years, I would go out to Zakistan and talk about it. And enough to, so that my friends, after like the third or fourth time, were like, okay, we actually have to like 
he's t spoken enough about it. We have to go check it out. Um, until, I mean, I would love to like riff on weird Zagastan stories, of which there are many. Um, Tell us. Weird the better. Well, I basically like. I founded Zagastan in 2005, and then after that, I studied abroad in India, and I had a homestay with some Tibetan exiles. So, you know, I had pictures of like me with a flag in the middle of the desert. Uh, and at the time, I was giving out, I had a stamp, and I was giving out citizenship certificates. And so I gave it to my homestay brothers, and they thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard, right? And they were amped, and so they were like, Thanks, Zakistan is the only country we hold citizenship to. And I was kind of confused. I was like, well, you guys are all born in India, right? Don't you, aren't you Indian citizens? And they're like, no, we're refugees. We have refugee status. We travel on Indian residency cards. If we're gonna become Indian citizens and vote, they make us pay money for that, that citizenship. So the formulation was a yeah, a, a little, yeah, tongue-in-cheek, uh, playful kind of riffing, and that's when it, Zakistan as a project collided with, like, kind of like dark reality, right? Because the whole point of Zakistan is not, I'm not honored or psyched that that's the only country they have citizenship. It's dark that, you know, they literally, you know, know like, um, you know, legitimate states will recognize them as citizens of anywhere, and that their their like day to day reality and their existence, but also their whole situation is, you know, extreme and dictated by the People's Republic of China. That situation, in a way that. Um, I think a lot of us have the luxury of not dealing with the state with borders and nations sort of in that way. So um, I kind of wanted to, and as I was kind of collecting my thoughts on like what we can all talk about here, again, yeah, like I could riff about times we hauled shit out to the desert. Um, but I think there's a, I would say in some ways, Zakistan has been very successful. In some ways, it's been kind of a failure. So I want to try and like peel apart maybe why I think it was successful and why, or in ways that it was or ways that it wasn't. So that I, I was fortunate at a kind of early age and at an early stage to have this experience with people whose relationship to nation states, governments, you know, is very serious. And so that has kind of uh, colored the project and has, uh, I mean, it's given me kind of more urgency or desire to um, say tug on this thread, right? Of this kind of sweater of things that we just accept, right? And that we, recognize as this is the way things are. So, um, you know, being friends with these people, knowing these people has kind of allowed me more urgency there. So I think there's a couple of things that I think has helped Zakistan be successful. Um, there was a kind of big viral event that happened in 2015. Um, so I think having a kind of piece of physical reality or a grounding in a uh, piece of land helped. Uh, and there is, um, there's images that we're kind of selective about the images we put out. And so uh, we don't totally, you know, like it's a lot of shots of us building stuff in the desert. So there's a lot of kind of, uh, there's some, you know, literally Zakistan is close to the Golden Spike spot where the, the North American continent was linked by trains. It was kind of one of the last places 
to be uh, kind of, you know, sort of settled or um, and so there's a kind of history there um, and there's a, a kind of tapping into the romantic idea of the West, the frontier, the uh, manifest destiny, the very, you know, Jackson Turner frontier theory. I think that, you know, for Americans, that's kind of baked into our education and sort of our mindset. When we think of the desert, we think of cowboys and John Wayne, sort of this thing. So I think that's helped. And I think the images and sort of what we portray is kind of us building this thing from scratch. Um, so we're literally bringing things out into the desert and making a thing. Um, and I think part of that, there, it's not um, just uh, solely a theoretical exercise. Um, and I think it, it's also response, uh, Zakistan as a whole is responsive to the place where it's at, right? So it, it's bounded by the state of Utah, which is um, kind of a bizarre state. There's a history <laughs> in that state of actually going to, or you know, going to war with the United States and uh, kind of choosing to be in a place where, or the more, you know, Elias Church chose that spot in particular to be away from other places. So I think there's a lot of um, tips of the cap or a little recon recognizing like kind of where we are, where we are and sort of um, fitting into the flavor of the place. And so I think that part has been helpful I think um, there's also a kind of the projects I've or I like we have executed out there are big enough. Well, like one, the place is too remote for me to go out by myself. It's like dangerous to be out there solo, and so the the whole project is inherently collaborative, like. Uh, you know, me as Zach and Zach Sam, like needs help and so also at a very early stage I had to bring other people in so that a lot of that was begging my friends <laughs> low, you know, laying like a low level guilt trip over a long <laughs> period of years and so by you know like by necessity the physical place itself needed to um, the concept or what I shaped needed to include other people. And um, and so kind of opening, and I almost kind of regret like naming it after me, like myself, because I'm it's not really I'm trying to make it about this, but um, so yeah, opening up that room for other people to operate, to shape the identity, to kind of formulate and determine like uh, the the na what the nation of Zakistan, what the, what it means to be a Zakistani, and what we value. So, um, so yeah, I think that has been very helpful. Um, and so I think with those kind of two things, I also like am an, a sculptor and an artist by trade. So having kind of a knack for and an interest in making things, constructing things, surface finish, and also I've been fortunate enough to have like a lot of extremely talented filmmaker, photographer, builder, friends to, to help me out. So I'd like to, or yeah, um, and I think kind of another reason why it may have been successful or at least has kind of spread way farther than I thought because, I mean, initially the idea was it was a little bit of a kind of home movie situation of, like, dudes I know, we'd go to the desert, build some stuff, uh, and it would be people, yeah, I knew or friends of friends. Um, once it got a wider, you know, spread and it, it uh, got intensely publicized, there was... Um, It got weird. Oh, I'll come back to that. It got kind of weird. But I think um, Zakistan as a
project as a thing, it doesn't lie. And I don't, I don't, we don't lie about it. And we are very deliberate to not um, make things up, right? So part of this, this is kind of the time it was, the era it was founded, it, the um, enhanced interrogation, the, uh, the Bush administration kind of stretching the English language really far to see what it could incorporate. And so like, in that sense, uh, Zakistan is a de facto sovereign nation. Um, it is a decrepit sculpture park. It, uh, <laughs> it is um, a conceptual art project. It's not one of those three, it's kind of all at the same time. And so, um, I, yeah, I don't wear a uniform, I don't give out titles, we don't have medals or much pageantry at all. I think we, we've gone hard on the souvenirs, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I think, um, yeah, there's a deliberate attempt, uh, I mean, myself and other Zakistanis to cleverly describe things, but to not get lost in our own um, creation, in our own sort of uh, um, web of, of, of uh, maybe a, a tangle of our own kind of little invention. We, uh, we attempt to face it outward, right, to, to kind of make it accessible and bring more people in. So I think that was part of the reason why it, it has been successful. Um, so in 2015, or I guess, in 2015 a local news reporter cold called me and uh, he was kind of a like Salt Lake News at 10 guy. And so he, you know, talked about wanting to do a, a piece on Zakistan and I asked him how he had heard about me and so my neighbor, I guess at the time, who's a little bit of a character, his name is Ivo Zadarsky, and he is originally from Czechoslovakia. He fled, I guess, the Eastern Bloc by building his own airplane, flying it over the Iron Curtain to Vienna. So he ended up in California and designed, you know, had a propeller design firm or company, and at some point he decided to buy a ghost town with an airstrip, which is, you know, in Great Basin terms, very close to Zakistan. <laughs> so he uh, he lived out. I think uh, he lived out there for a while, had his own airplane hangar, and essentially would just cruise around in his Cessna, like looking at weird stuff. And so he told me that he flew like ten feet off the ground to see like what the "Welcome to Zakistan" sign said. He also uh, like drove an immaculate Chevy Caprice, like a you know wood panel, real old thing, with big tires that he would just drive out to the desert. So this journalist did a story on him, and he was like, "Oh, if you like weird shit in the desert, you should check out." This <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> and so yeah, I, uh, I had a conversation with him, and I was like, "Look, I'm 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 into. I'd like to do a piece with you." I don't want to do a like, hey, look at this fucking guy story. You know, mm -hmm. there's a kind of conceptual bent, and there's a kind of message I'm trying to get across. And so he was like, cool. And so uh, I set up in Utah for you know a little while, uh, longer than you know than I had previously just passing through, and I got a lot of help from a lot of like yeah now key Zakistani people to kind of build new monuments, spruce the place up, and. Uh, he did a kind of nice little piece of like, here's what Zach says it is, here's what it actually is, here's kind of where it's working there, and here's what it's not. And so they aired it during sweeps uh, in the fall, and then my buddies in Salt Lake got to see themselves on TV at, at uh, the Hipster Bar. And then I got a, a lot of emails from people in Utah, and then I got an email from the Daily Mail asking if they could use some some images off my website. And so I was like, ooh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I want to do that. So I was like, fuck it, let's do it. <laughs> and overnight it was in like 40 different languages. It went through the AP wire. And so kind of, Zach, and it, 
I, you know, spent a lot of time kind of crafting the image, baking red flags into, <laughs> or I mean, I guess literal and metaphorical red flags into the stuff. So the surface should, your body should tell you like, or your, your body should want to, to say, you know, acknowledge this passport or this stuff is real, but your, your brain should be like, whoa, wait, <laughs> this is not right. Um, and so in that sense, the story went all over the place and uh, people accepted it hook, line, and sinker. So the headlines, you know, like New York man, fine, you know, declares sovereign nation in Utah desert guarded by robotic sentinels. <laughs> that headline turned into giant robots guard sovereign nation in Utah desert, which is, <laughs> it was actually kind of terrifying because the whole, <laughs> and the questions I did receive are like, do you have a flag? Like, uh, and not like, wait, does this exist? Where is this? What is your deal? And I would gladly have talked to them about it. Um, and so in that sense, there was kind of a massive like, success and failure at the same time in that it was not, it's supposed, the project itself is supposed to act as a, a theater flat maybe. So you see the scenery on the front, but you can also see the back, or I can show you the back. And it's, that became extremely difficult once it spread kind of globally. Um, uh, it seems it seems like other people have gotten passport and citizenship requests from you know Pakistanis and people from developing nations. And there's a darkness there. There's a darkness that's similar with you know the Tibetan ex exile friends of mine that. There is a, a darkness and I think a responsibility that freaked me out a little bit. So I kind of had to change my deal in that I could explain to the best of my language or to Zakistan government speak, um, but I couldn't ensure that they would understand like what what I was offering them, you know, what these documents would actually do. And so I had to kind of like take a step back um, and, I, and you know I, I kind of took a step back from the project as well because um, yeah that that responsibility kind of weighed on me and was not it didn't really it wasn't it wasn't fun you know and it wasn't and I've struggled to sort of how sort of how to present that because um, it's not it's not glamorous, um, and I think there there is a like we are we are kind of um, playing roles or um, conducting ourselves a certain way, and I think it does even if we're doing it tongue in cheek or whatever. There's a responsibility and a seriousness uh, we we do kind of what we do. So um, I mean that's kind of my thoughts on kind of developing countries uh, and projects, uh, you know, from scratch. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, in that sense, I'm not quite sure where Zakistan goes now, and I, it's kind of never been, uh, you know, just about me, and so I think the project itself has been able to leverage some press coverage and some attention, and so we're looking at how to convey that and, you know, parlay that into meaningful aspects, I think. Lately we've been, you know, it's kind of a pretty serious water problem in the Great Salt Lake, which kind of affects the Wasatch Valley and kind of that part of the Great Basin, which technically does affect Zakistan, and I guess it would be like more of a Mad Max hellscape than it, <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of now. So, um, yeah, so I've kind of recently restarted, um, restarted 
or we restarted in Zakistan um, to sort of roll it and uh, see kind of where where it can push against I guess more legitimate things, right, or reality. Like that's where Zakistan is most successful. I think is when um, it hits the general public or U.S. customs agents or um, places where people really have to encounter something and think about what they're holding, what they're seeing. Um, that's what I got. Um, like Grandview Travis said, um, my name is Uber AP of the Empire of Eternia. Um, Microphone. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Uh, is this a little bit better? Yes. Thank you. Let me know if you can hear me throughout the speech. I have been told I have a fairly low speaking voice. Uh, but as Grandview Travis well introduced, my name is Uber AP of the Empire of Eternia. Um, honestly, today's kind of a, a dream come true so, to some ways and uh, a little bit nerve wracking. Uh, and I'm not sure if any of the other speakers have felt that way, but. Uh, it's it's amazing to be in front of so many uh, sovereigns and people representing uh, the country. So um, the last few weeks, I have been racking my brain as to what to write to speak to uh, a, a group of other micronationalists and, and leaders from around the world. And so I have put together a few words, and I uh, I hope they resonate with you. We're the people that looked at the world and said, I'm needing something different. For me, it was every time I saw my parents struggle to pay a bill, to make rent, buy medicine, or put food on the table. They always made sure to think that things worked out in the end, but I wanted to make sure that people didn't have to worry about whether they could afford what they need. So when I was 17 years old, I founded the Empire of Eternia. When first starting out, I talked to my friends, my family, neighbors, anyone I could get my hands on to know about. Uh, even online, I would stream for days, weeks, months at a time to an audience of zero. And I know I'm not alone in that. I know many of you have felt like I have, calling out into the void and not being certain if there's anyone else to call back. But this community, the micronational community, is a place of people who defy what is probable to pursue what is possible. Thus, somehow, as we stumble blind and in the dark, we find our family. That's what happened to me. The more I kept shouting, slowly but surely those calls were answered. Before I knew it, we had our first citizen and our first alliance, our Discord server, and I started to feel like we'd found a place in the community. But the work of a people is never over, so we kept trying to grow. We built a government, we developed a market to sell our goods, and even produced advanced machines to aid our progress. And this worked well for a time. Though, no matter how much we built, we felt a burning for something more. I could see it before the lesson. I know our citizens could as well. There's a limit to how much any micronation can do. Anything. We see how every year new nations are born and others die out. The cycle repeating and forcing each of us in this room to face the question of whether there will be a day that is the last for our nation. In this regard, we have to pay respect to our forefathers, those here whose nations span decades and whose experience some centuries. Through them is the way forward. They are the teachers who built themselves and formed this community we see today, and they are the people who can teach us how to thrive. Because unfortunately, we don't have one. For those of you who consider themselves new to this community, your nation exists in a difficult time. Not only are you trying to sow the seeds of your cultural identity, but you're tasked with saving the world. Climate change will surely kill us, and our macronational brothers and sisters have not yet set us on a course to remedy it. If you believe that your nation exists for the good of its people, then it must act in their best interests. And momentarily, no matter your internal politics, your economic status, or cultural enlightenment, this is the highest priority. If we fail, the consequences are plain. But if we succeed in saving this world, we enter an era that marks the largest growth in micronational history yet, and prepares us for recognition of this community far beyond what we have previously seen. So we must learn to move forward, to continue the work that's been gifted to us. 
This community must unite in ways we've never seen before and on scales that will show the world a future of hope. In the Empire of Eternia, we've created a small but meaningful network of opportunities for all micronations. Including this is our micronational map, a feature on our website which micronations can submit their own information and search for others around the world. As well, we have our Discord channel, which allows for networking between micronationalists and non-micronationalists alike. And lastly we, lastly, we have our numerous social media accounts, in which we publish updates on Eternia and notable insights into our community. So this is just the start. In Eternia, we live by the arrow of progress, our national symbol representing a progressive community, guided by the belief that by working together, we can accomplish things other may, others may consider impossible. For me, today is an achievement of something that my younger self wouldn't think possible. Standing before esteemed world leaders, representing a nation that has grown to fill my heart and open my eyes, I see the mountain of progress that has led to today. From the financial support of our citizens and the larger community which helped to offset the travel costs for our delegation, to the advice and friendship we've gained through other nations, we come to you today with a message. If the world is a jungle, we micronations are akin to the humble ant. Overlooked by the world at large, we plant our flags, carve our territories, and grow our populations. While the world may not have time to be bothered by us, we shape its image. One blade of grass, one broken twig, one glob of mud. And eventually, no eye can avoid the mark we leave in every detail. So we must not dwell on our small stature, but see the beauty in our unique perspective. Together, we must lean on each other's strengths to overcome any weakness. We must unite behind common causes, amassing formidable presence. And we must waste no time to network amongst our fellow nations, creating opportunity for those that we represent here today. We, the Ants of Eternia, have started to form our mound and reaching out into the world. But now we ask, what's possible with a pile of ants? Well, Ants know the good team is crucial for success. I'm proud to say that in attorney, I'm constantly in awe of the people that support us. By name, our master of the House of Treasure, Stephen Vince, who has been a steady hand and a capable tactician through thick and thin. David the blacksmith, helping to pave our way in polished copper. And of course, Tiffany, whose powerful intellect is only overshadowed by her loving heart. Attorney is made up of incredibly passionate people who want to do what it takes to grow this community and make the world a better place. Now we need you. Leaders, diplomats, media, lend me your ears. The people of Eternia would like to know you. We would like to know your purpose. We would like to hear your ideas. But most of all, we need your collaboration. So please reach out to us. Tell us your problems, your limits, your frustrations. And in return, we can offer up our time, our resources, and our friendship. Because despite our many differences, we all started because we saw something that needed change. Now is our chance to achieve what we started. Thank you. And welcome. So today I'm going to be talking uh, about the Micronational Hall of Excellence. Uh, sort of a peek behind the curtain on what it is, uh, how it came to be what all has gone into getting us to the induction ceremony that we're going to be having tonight for our first eight members. So right here, pretty bare bones presentation, but there's the logo. Our current board members are Queen Carolyn of Ladonia, Grand Duchess Juliana of Ruritania, Emperor Jonathan of Austinasia, King George 2.0 of Slobovia, <laughs> Prince Jean-Pierre of Agmort, President Kevin Ball of Malasia, and myself. I currently serve as the board executive, um, which means um, we had an internal vote for a two-year term. After this induction ceremony, my term will be up, and we uh, either I will be reelected or we will elect somebody new and before we do the next induction cycle. There is room for that board to grow. The current, the cor current bylaws have us capped at no more than 13 and if we do grow we grow by two at a time so that we can keep a balance as a board executive I am I kind of steer the ship but I do not vote except to break ties 
Our voting body is made up of the nations um, that uh, have people that are on the board. And in addition to that, we also have the Arrogan Empire, Amethonia, Flandrensis, Obsidia, and West Two. Every single voting nation uh, gets two uh, members who vote for the, uh, for the board. Uh, after every single cycle, the way that we, we grow our voting body is two nations will be added. If a nation decides to, to leave the voting body, we don't replace them um, per se. The, the method of replacing them is that growth of two. We're hoping that overall more growth will happen than nations leaving. Um, but if there is also room in there that if we notice that we're shrinking the voting body, we have mechanisms built into our bylaws that allow us to, to, to change that or temporarily increase to three voting, uh, three voting nations. This is the Norton, the Norton Award, um, named for Emperor Joshua Norton. Um, and the design of it is actually taken from a combination of the Norton plaque that you can find out in San Francisco and the Norton medal that was um, that was for the Norton Awards that was done in the early aughts. Um, and Malassi, I believe, was the designer of that. So we kind of married the two and created something that was unique. Um, and then on the reverse of that, we have the Micronational Hall of Excellence logo. The logo itself was designed as a collaboration between myself, the Deputy Prime Minister of West Arctica, Brendan Cook, and uh, President Stephen Luke of Jakub. Uh, so we decided to put that on the reverse so that the effect would be uh, an award that can be displayed either with a more classical feel or something that's a little more modern, depending on the tastes of the person that's being inducted. And that is, uh, that is three inches in diameter. Uh, it is four millimeters thick. And that is, a, that is a 3D relief that honestly looks a lot better in person. <laughs> so, um, these are the eight inductees of the Micronational Hall of Excellence. So how did we get there? To start off, we open up a nomination phase. Normally, the hall is going to be up to four people at a time, but we decided to kick things off. We wanted to go with a, a double induction class. After this point, it's going to be four. So we opened up the first round of nominations. Every single voting nation gets to nominate any individual who has been, who has had at least a decade since they started their micronational career. They have to be in good standing in the community and they can have no history of service with the government of the nation that is nominating them to avoid any sort of nepotism. So after the first round, we went ahead, closed it, debated internally between the board, opened up the second round, and we got in, we, we wound up, we wound up uh, after that, putting forward a ballot of 16 names. We then went in, every single, per, every single, uh, voting member from a voting nation cast their ballots and then we took the top eight members or the top eight individuals who got at least 50 percent of the vote and that's how we wound up with president gabriel porche of Sauge, uh grand duke nicholas of flandrensis president kevin ball of Malassia, president roy of sealand uh stats minister lars Vilks of ladonia prince leonard of hot river grand duke travis of west arctica Woo! and emperor <laughs> and emperor norton um, there were there were some really great names that didn't quite didn't quite get enough votes that I'm pretty sure it's only a matter of time. Um, but aside from that, that's a that's a quick peek behind the curtain, and that's my presentation. Hey everyone, um, I'm King Andrew the First of Pontunia, um, a few other things. Um, <laughs> But um, what I came here to talk about was a little bit of a micronational diplomacy. Okay? I mean, I'm sure all of you have foreign relations. I have sure hope so, at least. 
Um, but many of us, especially those who might be watching in the future and want to start their own things, might be asking, where do I begin? Well, um, long story short, uh, social media, <laughs> um, but also, um, so I started out like January 2020, bored looking at MicroWiki, um, stumbled upon MicroWiki, and I was like, oh, should do that. Um, and I was like, I was also bored in school, so I was like, you know, whatever. I might as well start a phenomenon for myself. Uh, and well, two years later, here we are. Um, so, so um, yeah. So initially, I was like pretty much in an isolated uh, vacuum seal of sorts. Like, I there was not really any micronations in Louisiana that I knew well, nor did I, or micronationalists either, that I knew well. It was pretty much all I knew was me. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll uh, see if I, and then I went to uh, MicroWiki, the page and no, on the website, and I noticed they had a Discord. So I joined the Discord. If, for those younger in the audience, you know, if you know, um, and for those older who don't know, uh, ask your kid um, <laughs> if you have one. Uh, but yeah, so I joined the MicroWiki Discord community around um, the summer of of, uh, of twenty one. No, summer of 20, summer of 20. It's hard to remember sometimes. Two year, pandemic time lasts long. Uh, so I started and I just met met some of the people in this room online, um, obviously. But like, I've, I started to realize that, hey, I'm not alone. I got y'all guys, you guys. And um, eventually I found like a handful of people from uh, same state of uh, I'm same United States state uh, Louisiana uh, as me. <laughs> uh, now, like now, um, as for diplomacy for them, we have, since we both since I'm literally like an hour away from them, I was like, you know, be cool alliance. Um, that aged poorly. Long story short. Um, I will not go into detail for the for all of y'all's benefit because buffet coming up <laughs> uh, or food. Um, but long story short, um, some people cannot be can be uh, difficult to negotiate with. Um, and if I've learned anything from the past two years, is that you have to be kind to people, you have to be honorable, you have to respect all sorts of opinions. Because believe me, I. I don't want to get too deep into politics here, but I'm kind of a more right-wing guy, I guess you could say. Um, but I, I have, I have a belief in tolerance. I believe that people should, um, you know, accept others and just. Well, I wasn't always like that, but we all change. And, uh, and, well, Mahatma Gandhi was like, be the change you want to see in the world. And I was like, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> if it's good enough for Gandhi, it's good enough for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, you have to eventually start to open up to different different opinions, different worldviews, different, yeah, ideologies and beliefs. You got to you gotta work together, you know? Otherwise, well, you're back where you started in that vacuum seal. Um, isolated, alone, and if you keep trying to, you know, break out of that vacuum seal, you're eventually going to have to, instead of just, you know, trying to do it with your fists, you got to ask, sometimes you got to ask somebody to lift up the vacuum seal, and um, I think that's probably going to be all for me, yeah, yeah, here's going to be all. Um, Don John, John bienvenidos. Thank you all for being here. I'm Georgiana Gore, New Mexico Consul for the Duchy of, or the Grand Duchy of Plandensis. 
I stand before you today representing our nation our lead, and our leader, His Royal Highness Grand Duke Nicholas. The citizens of Flandrensis number more than 800 and reside in more than 70 nations worldwide. We are united by a concern for climate change and polar ice melt. Our mission is to ensure that Antarctica is untouched by human activity. We strongly believe that it should remain a nature preserve only available for scientific research well beyond the expiration of the Antarctic Treaty in 2048. For most of my life, I've been concerned about our environment and the effects of pollution. I was born in the year 1958. Back then, regular people didn't know much about the environment. By the time I had started elementary school, America was beginning to learn that we could not just do anything we pleased in our environment and hope to live. I remember hearing how the, the pesticide DET was killing all of our pelicans and even the American national bird, the bald eagle. Finally, DDT was banned. Later in my teens, I remember flying to see my mother in California. When we crossed the San Andreas Mountains, the smog was so thick in Los Angeles that you couldn't see the ground. And I wanted them to turn the plane around and take me back to East Texas, where the sky wasn't like that yet. <clears throat> the solution seemed simple to me as a child. Just stop doing it. But it's not that simple. Then as now, not everyone was convinced there was a problem. And even those who were convinced didn't want to give up lucrative business interests. In spite of this, slowly, laboriously, the world has started to turn the juggernaut of pollution. But more is needed going forward. This is a picture of our beautiful country. A couple of years ago, I came across Flandrensis on the internet. The idea of a nation with no permanent inhabitants and the reasons behind that preference intrigued me. I read further. As was said earlier in this conference, if you scream into the darkness long enough, someone will answer. As a child of the 1960s, I found little support for my environmental concerns, and then came the internet. As an adult in the 2020s, I believe it is remarkable to find so many people willing to address these concerns head on. Our citizens are united in our willingness to at least try to find a solution to some of our environmental problems to plant trees, and to sustainably and ethically grow food. To do these things without artificial chemicals which rob our earth of her ability to sustain us. That's what drew me to become a citizen of Flandrensis. As a nation, we hope that Antarctica is one of the few places on the planet to remain relatively untouched by humans. Unfortunately, Antarctica is no longer untouched. On March 15th of this year, the Conger Ice Shelf collapsed due to global warming in an area east of Antarctica where scientists had believed that the shelf was stable. It was not. This is after the collapse on March 15th. This was around the time of a more than 40 degree rise in temperature as recorded at the Concordia Research Station. This is not the first, and according to science, it won't be the last. Climate change is a fact. Whether you do or you don't believe climate change is human caused, climate change is a fact. My experience with nature spans 63 years. I have lived on the land, in the forests, deserts, and mountains of America and other countries my entire life. When I was a little girl growing up in East Texas, we would see flocks of migrating birds every spring and fall. The flocks were so large that you could stand and watch them pass for half a day. The sky was just black with them. We would see armadillos and possums. Fireflies lit the night. The horned toad was summoned to watch out for it because you'd step on them. They're <laughs> everywhere. The climate and environment are changing. Flocks of migrating birds are now so small that you can see all of a flock at one time. I have not seen an armadillo in at least a decade. There are no fireflies except in the most remote places. Horned toads are so rare that they are considered endangered across much of their former range. The Center for Biological Diversity in Tucson, Arizona, says that reptiles in general are dying off at up to 10,000 times their historic extinction rate, greatly due to human influence. <clears throat> there are many things that we as, if, as humans have done to accelerate climate change. Not all of those things have to do with a carbon footprint. The larger cities such as Dallas, Houston, Tokyo, Beijing, New York, Paris, London, and others contain so much concrete that it changes the ambient temperature. 
Concrete reflects heat into the sky and keeps rain from the land beneath. <clears throat> Besides human caused changes, climate change is actually driven by the earth herself. The eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815 caused a phenomenon called the year with no summer. The air was so thick with volcanic debris that it coated the entire planet. Since then, volcanoes in Iceland, the Philippines, and Hawaii, to mention a few, have affected global climate. The Inuit, indigenous to Alaska and a group who rely on stars for navigation, contacted NASA in 2012. That year, there had been two huge earthquakes in Indonesia, one of 8.6 magnitude and the other of 8.2 magnitude. The Inuit say that the positions of the stars have changed. This is pretty scary since that means the positions of our poles have changed, a thing which would definitely affect global climate. Fireflies, family Lampirida, are a beetle with a bioluminescent capability. They are a bug whose absence or presence has been linked to air quality. When I was a child, we saw them every spring in beautiful blinking hordes. My grandma once told me that there were not so many of them as there were when she was a child. I have not personally seen a firefly in at least 30 years. Like the canary in the mine, fireflies are our indication that our environment and our air quality are not what they used to be. There is little reason to believe that climate change is a false idea. As for the causes and effects, there are many theories. We humans are babies on this earth. We have no real historical experience in the arena of geological time. Flandrensians believe that planting trees can help mitigate climate change, and that is true. Mitigation of greenhouse gases by shoring up carbon dioxide storing activities can't be bad. It helps, but is it enough? Time alone will tell. In the meantime, our species needs to stop the destroying the forests that remain. I am a rancher and a farmer. Since I rely on the land to support me, I have made a habit of noticing when changes happen. For instance, there is a certain flowering weed that has always blossomed two weeks before the first frost. Now that wheat starts growing in early July and blossoms in a weak and half-hearted way around the middle of August, well before the first frost in the Hamas Mountains of New Mexico. September used to be the month when we started seeing wildflowers. No more. They are starting to grow and bloom in March. My goats and horses have been shedding their winter coats around the middle of July after the first monsoon rains. Now they are shedding in May. The changes seemed gradual to me over the last decade, but they are not gradual on the scale of geological time. Since around 2012, these changes have been accelerating every year. I'm not so sure what has caused these changes, although I suspect a combination of things. It's not warmer where I live, it's actually colder. We will have apples and plums this fall for the first time in three years. In the previous three years, the trees have blossomed and set fruit and then frozen in the latter part of May. Our low temperature this winter was negative 24 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 31 Celsius. We have not had much snow the past few years, even with the low temperatures. This means no water for our irrigation and no water for the gardens and pastures. In short, climate change is an everyday concern for us. <clears throat> Across the United, southwest United States, we've been subject to an historic drought for the last 20 years. Some say it is a 1,200-year drought. By my experience, this is not the cause of the changes that I'm seeing in the plants and the animals. I believe it is an effect of whatever has suddenly happened to the earth. This is not the first time this area has experienced horrific drought. That hill behind my house is a giant sandstone structure. It's a petrified sand dune. The other side of our valley is an even larger set of sand, petrified sand dunes with gigantic petrified trees in them. It takes a pretty serious and long-term drought to accomplish that. This has happened before. So what can we do? How can we survive as a species? What are our options? I feel as I have felt since childhood that we need to carry forward older, more earth-friendly ways of living on this planet. These ways are not remembered by most first world people. We call them city folk. <laughs> the indigenous peoples in the Americas and elsewhere across the planet have long been marginalized by more successful populations who sacrificed long-term well-being for short-term gains. 
Even as a five-year-old child, I recognized the need to save the knowledge that was being lost. My life's goal has been to educate myself in the old ways. I have been blessed with many opportunities to do just that. I have been blessed with elders who are willing to share their knowledge. My elders have taught me to farm and forage and herd. I know where to find medicine in nature and how to use it. I can cook on the wood stove or over an open fire. For the interim, we need to revive this knowledge and cease relying on a global supply system that is obviously fragile and not very ecologically friendly. It was not so very long ago that the people of the world had not even heard of gasoline. <clears throat> Excuse me. A hundred years ago, people did not regularly have electricity in their houses. Running water would have been supplied by a hand-cranked pump. Wells would have been dug by hand with a shovel. One hundred years is not so long. My grandparents and great-grandparents were born before that. They had stories to tell about what life was like when they were young. We need to relearn what it is to rely on our neighbors and our friends. In our community, the one where I live now, our farm raises milk goats, horses, chickens, ducks, turkeys, and various kinds of fruit. The neighbors over the hill raise a huge vegetable garden every year with which they supply the community. The neighbors down the street raise beef cattle according to organic ways. A lady who lives across the ridge from us is a curandera, which is a healer. She has a vast knowledge of natural medicine. In short, if there's a global emergency, we are confident that our little slice of heaven will be able to survive. What will happen to the rest of humanity? Go. When the population of a species has overcrowded its habitat, the concentration of the members of that species leads to the spread of disease. In New Mexico, an overpopulated prairie dog town will be partially wiped out by the bubonic plague. Leptospirosis occurs when too many rabbits inhabit the same one. By means of naturally occurring organisms, nature renews itself. Are we as humans now experiencing some of the same cleansing? We need to seriously consider that question. Inevitably, I believe our future lies in space. We are a highly successful species, but in some cases that sort of success can lead to failure. Diaspora, the flinging of genetic material out into the universe, is ultimately the only way our species can continue to survive. We could do so much good out there with proper guidance and morals. As a species, it is time for us to create for ourselves a bigger place. We must learn from our mistakes in this habitat and learn to properly care for our next habitat. In the same way that a rabbit warren will eventually die out due to lack of resources and room, our earth is now telling us that we need a bigger place to graze. Can we move to this new pasture? Well, yes, we are about to do so. Can we move into the new world of the 21st century in a more sensitive way than our ancestors moved into the new world of the 15th century? We can and we should. If we do not, we too will become extinct. I am proud to serve Flans Flandrensis as consul in this gathering. I am proud to work beside my fellow citizens for the good of our planet and our species. Micronations working together can help bring awareness of these issues to the larger world. On Change Now in Paris, the founder of Landrensis, our Grand Duke, was invited to speak for scientists and climate activists about ecological micronationalism. Micronations are a starting point for humans to come together in defense, not just of our Earth, but of our species. And one last thought. Remember, rain makes a hole in the stone, not because of its force, but because of its persistence. We must persist. We can make a change. Thank you very much. First, I just want to thank uh, the organizers for this event. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm Robert Modem. I am not a micronationalist, uh, but I'm a PhD student in theater uh, studying micronations um, and studying many of you. Um, Quite graciously and perhaps optimistically, uh, the organizers put professor on my name today. I am not a professor yet. Um, it's almost as high a title as knight, though, so the, uh, the double upgrade in title was really nice yesterday. My supervisor was super impressed. Um, so I discovered Micronations actually uh, through a video of Microcon Atlanta. 
Um, I think I'd known about micronations peripherally on the side view uh, for quite some time, but I uh, came across, I think, a Vox 10-minute documentary, and at the time was looking for a topic for my dissertation. I knew that I wanted to look at performance, I knew I wanted to look at geography, um, and uh, perhaps politics, all of these different passions, and I stumbled across this video at 3 a.m. on a YouTube rabbit hole, and saw a number of your lovely faces, and was hooked. Uh, and the next day, I took my laptop into my supervisor's office, and didn't say a word, just hit play. We sat there in silence for 10 minutes as each of you were interviewed, and we were just like, yeah, 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 this is, this is it, this is the thing. Um, at the time, <laughs> uh, I think it was late 2019, and I was living in Hamilton, and I Googled, and I did research, and discovered that MicroCon had happened in my city just months prior, and that I had missed it. But when I found out the next one was in Las Vegas, and that the university would pay me to come here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so when I tell people that I am doing a, uh, a dissertation on micronations, they have two questions. You can do a PhD in the future, <laughs> and what is a micronation? Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that question two um, we have a general sense of in this audience. <laughs> Uh, so you can do a, uh, a PhD in theater. What does what does that look like? Uh, today it looks like performing at uh, MicroCon in <laughs> Vegas. Uh, over the last two years, though, it has meant reading every single article I could find online about the one and only Kevin Baugh. Um, <laughs> and excellency, there are so many. Uh, it has meant scouring YouTube for interviews with Travis McHenry. Uh, and following almost all of your projects on Twitter and Instagram, all of your faces are very familiar to me in the least creepy way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recently, though, I had the opportunity, I was um, speaking at a uh, conference in Iceland on the topic of migrations, um, and used it as an opportunity to uh, hit up Ladonia, to fly over to Sweden and venture to Ladonia. I realized that it was just a, you know, three-hour flight, hour train ride, 20-minute ferry, hour and a half bus, followed by a two-hour hike up and over a mountain into Madonia, which it might not be quite as remote as uh, Zakistan, but uh, it's much more remote than I thought when I bought my plane. <laughs> Uh, this is me on site in Ladonia. Uh, the last picture here, I'm like crossing over the border. Uh, for those of you who have been, it is quite the trek. Uh, it's quite remote in Sweden. Um, what was funny is, I'm not a hiker. Maybe you can tell that by my, <laughs> by my body type. Um, but I, so I'd arranged, uh, I'd done a bunch of research, done a bunch of Googling, read all the reviews online of how to get to Ladonia. There are a number of blogs out there. Um, and all of them sort of reference this treacherous hike, this hike that's up and over a mountain. They say, don't go if it's raining, because it'll be slippery. You know, some people have to be airlifted out of this, this space. Um, and uh, I think my partner was very concerned. A couple of friends were like, maybe you should invest in some hiking boots. Uh, and then I wrote on the uh, Ladonia Facebook page and tried to contact members uh, to see if anybody would, um, would guide me out there, would be a friend and, uh, and help me out there. And I connected with uh, Frederick Larson, the Minister of Art and Jump for Ladonia, and uh, we, we met on site uh, and he walked me in. However, uh, he goes out almost every weekend and does a bunch of maintenance on the project um, on Nimitz, which is a large wooden structure you've probably seen photos of. Uh, so he adds wood to this structure every single weekend. Uh, and when we got out of the car, he informed me that he had brought a bundle of lumber for me to carry <laughs> again <laughs> up and over this mountain, uh, which is pictured in the, the left there. Uh, and so then, because he didn't want to put nails through the wood on site, uh, the lumber came pre-nailed. So <laughs> the, the hour-long hike was, uh, was a bit awkward. I don't think I've ever been so sweaty in my entire life. But uh, Ladonia, it, it was worth the hike. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Uh, so all of this is for a PhD in theater. How is this theater or performance? Uh, so when I talk about theater and performance, I don't mean theater the aesthetic art form. I'm not studying dance or acting. I'm not looking at plays or musicals, although I enjoy them. Um, I'm looking, I'm talking about performance 
um, I'm looking at uh, what we might call uh, the performative. I believe micronations are performative. Uh, and the performative, the term performative, I think over the last few years has gotten a bad rap. It's become synonymous with fake or false or ungenuine. Uh, we see this in uh, sentences or phrases like performative allyship, performative activism, performative politics. It's come to be yeah, known as fake. Uh, my discipline, performance studies, and this project uh, reverses that. It takes this idea of the performative back to its origins, uh, in which the performative really means real. Uh, Um, <coughs> so my work looks at, uh, and bear with me, I'm a professor now, so I'm going to do a little <laughs> tiny bit of performance therapy. Uh, my my d uh, dissertation looks at the work of linguist J.L. Austin, and he's this guy in the early 20th century who wrote a collection of letters called How to Do Things with Words. Uh, and he defined the performative. For him, the performative uh, is a, a speech act, a series of words that perform the action to which they refer. That sounds convoluted. His, <laughs> uh, his example is saying, I do in a marriage ceremony. So when you're a couple and you say the words, I do in a marriage ceremony, that creates a change, that causes something to happen, uh, that causes two people to be married. Another example, christening a ship by launching a boat, by pushing, uh, hitting a bottle against it, and, uh, and renaming a ship by going through that action and saying, I named this ship the Queen Elizabeth, uh, that <clears throat> creates a change. So I want to suggest here that I believe that micronations are founded through a series of similar performative utterances. Uh, similarly to saying, I do in a marriage ceremony and having that make a change, your speech acts and your, your speeches and actions, such as I claim this land, I found this country, I draw these borders, um, changes the very ground on which you stand and creates, calls your migrations into being. Uh, we can also see, uh, I want to propose that we can also see a bunch of performances currently happening in this room. <laughs> uh, these flags might be seen to be a performance of diplomacy, um, of statehood, uh, your regalia, sir, might be a performance of, um, oh, uh, of power, of gravitas. Uh, your medals, your snowflakes are certainly a performance and representation of West Antarctica. Uh, we see it in our conversations uh, interpersonally as we, as we gather and walk around. Your curated uh, uh, posters and displays are all curated uh, to, to showcase and to perform your nation. So where am I headed next? Uh, looking forward, um, <laughs> much like Benny over there, I uh, am super interested in speaking to any and all of you about your micronation. Um, these are some of the main questions that I'm looking into. Uh, how do you perform nationhood? How do you perform the idea of nationhood? Uh, is it through declarations, through actions, rituals, anthems? Is it raising the flag over your property every single morning and pledging allegiance? Uh, is it through objects, um, many of which are scattered around the room? Uh, or is it through diplomacy uh, at events like MicroCon? Uh, the project is also interested in, uh, in intersections of micronationalism and gender, performance and gender, uh, as well as decolonial, anti-colonial, satirical or subversive projects. Um, I, uh, I'm from Canada, I'm from Toronto, and right now we are, our country is going through an incredible process of reconciliation within Canada's indigenous populations. And so there's an element of this project that questions um, the process of making a micronation uh, on colonized territory. Uh, and so I am interested in that little aspect. Um, uh, of how some of these actions, some of these performances might be read. That's my contact. I don't have business cards like Benny. But um, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. I hope to see you around today, tomorrow. Let's chat. Questions, and uh, I just, I appreciate it so very much. 
Um, and before we get started, uh, I do want to say, uh, please can we give a big rousing round of applause for Grand Duke Travis for all the work he has done today. I, I did not realize the work to put together a, a, a micronation, but much less put together a conference where all of the micronations come together. So, uh, oh my goodness, just uh, I'm blown away, uh, as is our staff, you will meet in a second. Uh, thank you for lunch. Uh, just can you, uh, do you have your computer? Can you just make a quick note uh, for a small re refund? I had ordered the uh, cordon blue with couscous <laughs> for lunch, and uh, I got the turkey sandwich, so I don't know if that was my purpose, but uh, just if you can... Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So, welcome. Um, this is the United Territories of the Sovereign Nation of the People's Republic of Sloriamistan, but you can just call us... Uh, the agenda before we get started um, is going to take about four and a half hours. Um, uh, so you can just see what we're going to be uh, discussing. We'll have a break, uh, 2.5 minute restroom break in about two hours. Uh, so hopefully you can hold it. Uh, no, he told me I can't do that. So I'll give you the very abridged version uh, very quickly um, because it is not about me. It is about my citizens and you and, and the people that have helped. But I do want to introduce myself. Who is this guy? Uh, my name is uh, Randy Williams. I am the Sultan of Slojavistan, uh, but my day job, I am a radio personality. Uh, I'm on the radio. I have written two books, as many of you have uh, written as well. I am a filmmaker and I am a world traveler. Um, very quickly, my radio show airs on about 200 radio stations in 14 countries, including here in Las Vegas. If you live in the United States, chances are my uh, show is on uh, in your city, okay? So you can go to my website, slowjams.com, by the way. I was on Shock Tank, Shock Tank uh, in 2013 with uh, Mr. Brian McKnight, who is a Grammy Award winner, and we presented the, my show to the Sharks. I did not present to them uh, the Micronation idea. They would have thrown me out onto the street, <laughs> but I did present my radio show. It was a lot of fun. This is some books and some movies that I did. Um, I did want to ask, um, does anyone know how many countries on the planet Earth that is? You can call it out. How many countries? You said 200. What else? 193. Very good, my friend. 193 to the man in the purple tie. Yes, very good. There are 193 countries on Earth. Now, that can be debated because, of course, uh, we count our micronations as countries. But when we say 193, we say 193 fully recognized countries by uh, the UN. I have been, uh, today, I have been to 182 of 193. Uh, my goal is to see every country in the world uh, scheduled for uh, completion in January, God willing, knock on the wood. Um, just a few of my travels, some fun places, uh, Libya and all throughout Africa, South America has been amazing, the Venezuela, the Argentina with the tango, the Peru, um, Afghanistan in 2020, uh, Palestine, Yemen, uh, Iraq was uh, number 100. Uh, I love the Pacific Islands, I have nine left. Uh, my last 10 countries include nine Pacific Islands. Uh, had fun in Asia, including <laughs> Kazakhstan and Bhutan and uh, Mongolia, and of course I spent three nights in uh, North Korea in Pyongyang uh, against the advice of my mother and all of my friends, uh, <laughs> but I did it and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, it was a blast, so I absolutely love travel. But alas, this is not all about your sultan, it is about the people that built Slow Jamistan, so if you will indulge me, I would like to give you a quick uh, introduction to Sloyamistan and the people that helped build this fine nation that is just in its infancy. Uh, first, our secretary, uh, Mr. Tim Richards. Could you please stand and say hello to everybody? What is Tim? Say hello to Tim, everybody. And a couple of fun facts about Tim. He, was, uh, he owns every episode of uh, Golden Girls on the VHS. Yes. Uh, he actually, this is true, I'm not making this up. He sang back up on the Backstreet Boys' very first album. Very first album, it is him singing. Don't play games with my heart. That is him in the background. He is afraid of clowns. He is afraid of clowns. And some people on here are borderline as clowns, so if he runs away from you, it's because of all the, all the, the colors and the balloons uh, can scare him. Uh, this is the man in charge of uh, protecting our sovereignty on a day-to-day -day basis. A, a Mark Corona is our chief border patrol agent. Mr. Corona, could you please stand and say hello to everybody? Say hello to Mr. Mark Corona. Of course, what would it be without some fun facts about Mr. Corona? He starred in MTV's Real World Tijuana version, uh, season one through five. And he once, this is true, he once dated Shakira Jenkins. She lived on the east side. <laughs> She lived on the east side, and very nice young lady, it didn't work out, but uh, yes, he once dated Shakira. 
Uh, he is an expert at border security because he once illegally crossed one himself. So that is Mr. Corona. Uh, finally, our director of emergency services. In, in, if anyone needs any help, he is here today. He is trained. He is Rescue Rick. Could you please stand up? Rescue Rick. Say hello to Mr. Rick. Of course, some fun facts. He uh, once wrestled a bear. And it was actually a 10-year-old boy in a Winnie the Pooh costume on Halloween. But he was able to pin him down in less than 15 seconds when he approached the Slow Jamistan border. It was epic. He does speak fluent Mandarin, and he will not eat peanut butter and jelly unless the crust are cut off. <laughs> I believe they were not today. Another uh, little refund on the uh, final bill there, uh, Grand Duke. And uh, finally, I'd like to recognize uh, some governors and governors of our states. Uh, can you please stand up, Mr. Uh, Donald Kaliva and Samantha Speckmeyer are the governor and governors of Don Samwadi, <laughs> which is a state in Sloyamistan. We will talk about that in a little bit. And the governor, Glenn Palmer of Palmerstan and Upper Palmerstan. Where is Glenn? Where is Mr. Glenn? There he is. Say hello to Glenn Palmer. Very fine people. We'll talk about them a little bit more. Uh, finally, some citizens joined us. Uh, Kathy and Melissa, could you please stand up? Kathy. And Melissa, this is a very beautiful picture. And uh, Kathy was just named ambassador to Utah. So uh, yes, good to have the uh, young ladies with us. Um, and then finally, the uh, Slojemistan Secret Service, which is, you see they are behind me. And they are not just for my protection, they are for all of our protection. So thank you very much. Sorry about the, the restroom thing. Uh, we apologize. Uh, before we start, I do want to talk about some quick inspiration. Uh, of course, we know this guy, President Kevin Vaughn, the First Lady. I visited in August 2021 with absolutely zero, zero intention of starting my own micronation. In fact, after I saw how amazing uh, President Ball's micronation was. I said, of course I cannot start one. It is very hard to do, very expensive, lots of buildings, the telephone, the, the train station. Uh, I would tell you we had such an amazing time. The only thing as far as inspiration on this trip for me was the name, because I looked at my best friend, I said, we should make a country of our own. We'll call it Slojamastan. And we laughed, and then we went home and never spoke of it again. Um, <laughs> But I left, I left intrigued. I, I had many sleepless nights. I would wake up dreaming of President Baugh and this beautiful <laughs> land. And I said, man, how can I make a micronation of myself? How can I do it? The buildings, the tiki lounge, the post office, it is impossible. My, I live in a very small house. The HOA would go batshit if I stopped the building stuff. So what am, I, what am I going to do? But there was more inspiration. Is Mr. Uh, Landsberg here today? Is he still here? Is he is Zach here or is he upstairs smoking that stuff that makes him very relaxed? <laughs> I don't see him, but I was so excited to see him. Zakistan was it for me. I saw this online and I said, wait a minute, this guy went to the desert. He put up some signs, some beautiful sculptures. It is a dream and he loved it and he's having so much fun. So that was the final moment I said, I must make a micro-donation of my own. And the rest is Slow Jamistan history. That is part one. We'll go to, to some quick Slow Jamistan history now. Uh, land Ho, August 4th, 2021. I found a beautiful piece of land right off Highway 78 in uh, Southern California. Uh, here is our location. We are about uh, maybe one hour south of, uh, you know, Palm Springs. We are in Palm Springs about 35 miles north of uh, Mexico. Uh, you see, there we are. Uh, right above us is the Salton Sea. Who knows about the Salton Sea? Anyone know about the Salton Sea? It's very interesting. We are going to change the A to the U and call it the Salton Sea. <laughs> it is in progress with the uh, Imperial County Commission, so just you wait. Uh, but then it is nice and close, and there is uh, Sloyamasan, uh, very near the Salton Sea. Uh, we did our groundbreaking on November 11th, 2021, where he broke the ground and we put the sign and we declared that, uh, well, we did not declare yet, we put the desk. We, we found this desk on uh, OfferUp uh, for a very low price and we brought it out to Slojamistan for a photo opportunity and we said, look at us, we are going to be a country. And then uh, a month later, our desk was stolen. We came back and it was gone and it was just, it was gone. So we had to buy a new desk. It was uh, a very, very first uh, act of aggression. We, uh, we suffered. So we learned our lesson. Uh, we declared independence shortly after on December 1st, which is just a few months ago. So we had a very new nation, um, a very simplistic uh, declaration of independence. We believe in less is more. We are minimalists. We did not want to waste the ink in the environment. So that is our declaration of uh, independence. And it was a very, very exciting day for us. First public gathering was not too long ago on February 6th. We had just under 10,000 people. And uh, it was... 
such a such a good time and a magical experience first time in public and uh, finally our last get together was just in may where we named two states actually three uh governor palmer uh got suckered in, i mean uh enjoyed <laughs> enjoyed naming two states uh palmerstad and upper palmerstad and then of course donald and samantha and beautiful dog buddy and uh, don samwadi is their uh, their state and they're very very beautiful states and uh, yes we welcome them as one of uh, 12 states in Sloyanistan. And we've reached our halfway point. Do not worry, we're almost <laughs> finished. Uh, we're going to give you some fast facts about Sloyanistan. Total area just over 11 acres. Uh, recognized by my mother, and that is it. <laughs> uh, but that is the Sultan's mom, to be honest with you. She still thinks this idea is crazy. She doesn't really understand. I play her the videos, and she's confused. And I just say, Mom, relax, and uh, give her a drink. And she, anyway, it's a long story. 422 registered citizens today. And as a couple of people mentioned, thank you. As a couple of people mentioned, the administration and all the emails and the, the requests and the applications, that is Mr. Zach, you missed your shout out, my friend. I'm so sorry. But we spoke very highly of you. Are you back from the smoke break? You're ready to enjoy it. Okay, you look very relaxed, Mr. Zach. Thank you, very relaxed. Uh, 2,000 people in queue. Uh, like I said, lots of applications stacked up. We have citizens in 28 countries, and it's very excited when, for example, we have a citizen in Burundi, and when he sends the application, I write him back personally, and I says, welcome, and I say, I have been to Burundi. And I show him a picture, and he can't believe it. He says, why would you come to Burundi? And so <laughs> traveling for me is great because it helps bring people together. And anyway, lots of uh, wonderful people. One of our goals is to fill all the map up with the, the people of Sojamistan. Uh, border security, let's talk about that, because every sovereign nation needs a, a strict border. So you have seen we have begun the border wall. Um, that sign is very close to the sign of Molossia, so that was one of my inspirations. Um, and I may have stolen one or two jokes from President Barr. <laughs> I made a joke once that might have belonged to him, and the First Lady commented right underneath on Facebook. It was very awkward, so I will not be stealing any more jokes. But once again, thank you for the inspiration. Uh, that is Mr. Corona. As you know, he is protecting our border. That is our gate. That is our flag flying proudly. Uh, we do have, now this is very important, okay? Uh, we do have landmines, and it's a real thing. And um, the ATF is not too happy with us. Uh, but to think about our, our landmines instead of explosions, um, has anyone had Mexican candy? Has anyone had Mexican candy? You are not very ethnic in here. Lots of people from Minneapolis. But if you live in, if you live in Las Vegas or California, the Mexicans, they have the candy. It's as, uh, it's as very sweet at the beginning. And then when you bite into it, it's, oh, it's chilly inside and it's very hot. So our landmines explode with Mexican candy and confetti. So light bruising and the sensation of the taste buds. And, but that's the only damage that's going to happen. Uh, these are our states. We have, as I mentioned, 12 states, and they, it surrounds the capital of Dublandia, and we have uh, many of the states already spoken for. Uh, what else? The political system is a <laughs> dictatorship on most days. Sometimes I pass the hat around and ask people's opinions, but of course the final say is with your uh, sultan. Uh, the official language is English with GFA. Does anybody, has anyone studied the website, does anybody know what GFA is? You in the back, nice and loud. General foreign accents. We are not making fun of anyone. I've had some people on the Facebook saying, you're racist, you're making fun of someone. I go, well, who am I making fun of? And they say, I don't know, but somebody. It is a combination of every accent I've heard everywhere, from India to Armenia to Guatemala to Cuba. And we put it all together, we mix it up, and you get GFA. It is to be, it's inclusion. We want to include everybody. Uh, who has heard our national anthem? Has anyone heard our national anthem? Oh, not many people. I promise it's one of the best works of art ever. It was uh, written by yours truly, the Sultan. It was performed by a man named Shelton John, and uh, people say it sounds a little bit like a song called Rocket Man. Have you heard of this song, Rocket Man? I've never heard of such a thing, but uh, apparently our anthem sounds like Rocket Man, so please, homework assignment is to listen to the anthem at slowjanistan.org. It will haunt your dreams for many days to come. Uh, the currency is the double, it rhymes with the ruble, and uh, we have many bills, and coming soon the coin is the doubloon, and you can see our coins uh, next to our, uh, our display over there, so this is the doubloon. And of course the national music genre is slow jams, if you don't know what slow jams is, it is another word for the romantic music. So you have the John Legend, uh, Vanessa Williams, uh, Alvi Shur, Tony Braxton, and way back in 2002, by the way, if you take pictures of me and you say, why is this one face lighter? 
And then the other side, it's because I have not washed my cheek since I got the kiss from Jennifer Lopez. And this is not, this is not the Photoshop. This is the real kiss back in 2003, and I have not washed the cheek since. Our national animal is the raccoon. We respect and revere the raccoon. He is a very special animal for Sturjamistan. You are not allowed to feed the raccoons. Uh, we have a trained staff to feed the raccoons. Um, the cholesterol came back very high, so uh, no feeding tacos to the raccoons. And finally, that brings us to some of the very important laws on uh, what Slow Javistan was founded on. So we'll go through some of our laws and values. Um, I don't know how this room reacts when you're driving by a car and then you see the feet on the dash. We think it is absolutely horrid and abominable, and so we have forbidden it in Slow Javistan. So if you'd like to visit us, please keep your feet on the ground. Um, the, the only person that it is the only person that is more guilty of the person with the actual feet on the dash is a driver who allows the feet on the dash. So you will be penalized if you are driving with somebody and they put the feet on the dash and you just let it slide. That will not slide with the Sultan, and that is probably what should happen. So word to the wise, um, reply all email. It is not necessary, okay? The boss sends a note out and says, great job, the company of 500 people, you have made your bonus this month, and there is always one ass kisser that hits to reply all and says, happy to do it, sir. And then it goes to everybody in the office, and it repeats so on and so on, so the reply all email is, is not very good. Uh, what is this called? Does anyone know what is this called? String cheese. Yes, I need three volunteers, please. Three volunteers who may have a little room in their stomach to have a little string cheese. Can you please come up? First three, come up. You look like you enjoy string cheese on a daily basis, as do you. And, okay, we have the third person, like... Three string cheese aficionados. Can, can I please have our chief border uh, agent come up and to, uh, come up to the front and turn around? And I think you have brought us, uh, brought us a, a nice prize here, yes? String cheese, one. We have two string cheese. And here it comes, number three. Could you please pass those out? Gentlemen, please open those up. You don't have to eat the whole thing, but do not, uh, do not start until I tell you to go. But please prepare it. He wanted to unwrap it earlier today and stick it in his pocket without a wrapper, and I said, that is very unsanitary, so it is, it is wrapped for your protection. You take it out. There you go. Don't drop it on the ground. These are very expensive from Costco. Okay. Okay, now, it's not the race, okay? So when I say begin, just relax. It's not whoever eats it the quickest. I'm just curious how you eat your string cheese, okay? So we have trouble. We good? Okay, here we go. So just relax. It's not the race. Uh, just enjoy your string cheese. One, two, three. Here we go, we're enjoying. Oh my goodness. Okay, everybody step aside to the side of the, the, the screen, please. Okay. Actually, I would like to say, Mr. Huff, well done, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Salza, well done. Please make some noise for these two gentlemen here. And you, you can sit down and enjoy the rest of your cheese, but no, I need a word with you, my friend. No, 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 no. Did you see? Did you see what this guy did? He literally stuck the cheese in his mouth and took a big chomp out of it like an animal, my friend. Why would you do that? It is called string cheese. So if you want to eat cheese like that, he is very insulted. He just got up. He has had enough. Um, anyway, when you're in Slow Jamistan, you must not bite the uh, cheese. You must pull the strings delicately and give it the respect that it deserves, okay? Thank you very much. Volunteers, make some noise, please. Thank you. Oh. My stress level went up so much, I was like, let all three of them be champions, please, and there is always one. So now we have all learned, and, and our final law, and this is the most important law of Slojamistan, and actually we are, we are petitioning other governments around the world uh, to adopt this law. Uh, no crocs are allowed in Slojamistan. I think I like you, because you agree, that's very good. Look, it's a very polarizing subject. Uh, I was in the uh, United States airport the other day, and there were crocs everywhere. I'm like, what is happening here? It was just absolutely awful. Uh, the crocs, just, it's, it's, it's silly. They don't look good. They're, uh, I imagine they're, they're smelly. They're rubber. Uh, anyway, that's the crocs. And we have made only, only seven arrests for the crocs so far. Um, I think people are finally getting to learn the lesson, and, and the word is spreading, no crocs allowed, in the slow jammers there. And finally, we close with the future. These are just some ideas. We have big dreams, we have big hopes, we are still raising funds. Uh, we have a suggestion box. 
in Slojamistan so people can make suggestions of what they think Slojamistan needs. We have talked about an armadillo farm, which we were talking about earlier today. Uh, they are endangered, so maybe they could come to Slojamistan and live crock free and enjoy the beautiful sun and sound of Slojamistan. And all you can eat Mongolian barbecue has also been on the petition. And uh, finally, a lazy river. And uh, the problem is, uh, we have the river already made, but there's no water, so it's just super lazy now. You put the tube in the river and you just sit for a long time and nothing happens, and it's the laziest river of all. If we can figure out how to get water to Sloyamistan, uh, we will have a lazy river, hopefully soon. And thank you, I'll leave you with a quote from your sultan. To all of you, I say thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true, you're a pal and a confidant. And if you threw a party and invited everyone you know, you would see the biggest gift would be from me, and the card attached would say, thank you for being a friend. And that is it. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. Of the Grand Emperor of Romania. This person, I want to start off by saying, holy crap, I can't talk that. <laughs> but uh, I'm here to talk to you about something very near and dear to my heart, and that's history, specifically micronations in history, and how nations inspire other nations. And first up is historical inspiration. Why start from scratch? You can pick up a torch. Many nations out there, micronations, macronations, every kind of nation you think of, often gets their inspiration from other states that received them, be they micronations like uh, the Republic of Malaysia, Grand Duchy of Antarctica, in my case, Kalsahar, or real nations like German Reich, uh, German Empire, I should say, the uh, Kingdom of Prussia, the British Empire, many other states throughout history. A lot of micronations tend to look to them for not only inspiration, but for symbols like coats of arms, or flags, or anthems, or even for just culture in general. And through this, a lot of micronations tend to connect with the past, try to connect with the roots that preceded them, and try to build up upon them to create their own community. Uh, a lot of people find it that instead of starting from scratch with no basis, no grounds in any historical state, it would be a lot easier to build up from what others left behind. Most nations, in fact, do not simply steal historical precedent, but as I said, they try to build upon them in new and innovative ways. A good example, of course, would be uh, Affirmation West Arctica. You took a lot of, I wouldn't say direct inspiration, but you took a lot of regalia, you took a lot of symbols from European uh, countries, European sources, but only at a surface level. You went bananas with them and you built, <laughs> well, probably one of the best nations here. Oh, thank you. Another good example, of course, would be the Queen of Ruritania. I think uh, you don't get much more European than Ruritania. <laughs> Speaking of which, adding on, making something your own. There are several ways micronations adapt history to their own. Many micronations build on the myths, the traditions of their historical inspiration. I know uh, one of my good friends, Christina, the Imperatoria of Psycholia, she built on it in many ways. She, uh, joke a lot people have is that she kind of has a little British empire going on where she has Psycholia, she has all the colonies. But she, she took it not just on a basic level, but she's a good example because she took an idea, the mythology around the British Empire, the regalia, the history, the culture, and built upon it into something new, something great. And some micronations may also choose to adapt multiple states at once. I'm sure many of us here are looking to build their micronations, went through Wikipedia, or went through other sources, and said, that's a good tidbit. It's a good tidbit right there, too. We have to take it. And of course, the most common uh, form of micronational historical precedent would be surface level inspiration. Uh, another form of micronational inspiration comes at the surface level. This is mostly through the adaptation of general themes, titles, leaving at that. Choosing only to loosely associate with an historical base or utilizing several historical nations as a starting point. I uh, speak of this personally as myself. Uh, when I formed the Grand Emperor of Rufania and reorganized it for my, uh, my previous micronation, uh, I looked towards several countries that have come and gone. I looked towards the Middle East, I looked towards Europe, I looked even towards Asia, and I said, what made these countries work? What traditions, what styles help build unity, help build a functioning government? And inevitably, I ended up going towards uh, Imperial Iran, uh, Kuwait, and Afghanistan for inspiration. And I took multiple aspects. Our flag uh, shares some references with the old flag of Afghanistan. 
our coat of arms shares some inspiration from Libya. Our anthem is also Afghanistan, and even my title, Grand Amir, was a build-on of the previous Arabic title of Amir, which is so common in places like Kuwait, UAE, Dubai. Another thing I have to get to at this point, ripoffs. I think anybody who spent any time on MicroWiki has seen the amount of countries that call themselves New Prussia. <laughs> no, I'm not the first. <laughs> but uh, this is the level of historical precedence. I'm glad to say I don't think anybody here has fell into or ever will. And I hope to see that any new micronationalists who might hear this don't ever go down this path. Because when you tighten it yourself to, we are this country, we are the continuation of this country, when you have no precedent, it doesn't work. Just saying you're the new something doesn't really make it so. So in conclusion, the crappy micronation started. <laughs> <laughs> the flag too simple, too complex, almost always uses a certain flag maker. I know micronationalists of a certain country. Their army, there's a couple kids with Nerf guns. But they're effective, but I don't want to use that. This one will hit home with some people. Planes are hard to get to a place they'll never visit. <laughs> That's not me. That's not me. <laughs> Sometimes named after a long dead state. You probably have no plan to. Uh, but there's one I don't really agree with. Under 14 bonus points if they name their country after themselves. But, you know, I don't know anybody here with that. And finally, picks a political ideology they know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> If you want to make an ideology, you want to be communist, you want to be a monarchy, just do it. That's it. That's my speech. Wow. Thank you, everybody. Hello, bro. <laughs> my name is Igor, and I'm Prime Minister from the Northern Bahamas. Uh, and I would like to see sayings for the uh, for the us for the meeting you, and it is very important for us to be here. Uh, I would like to represent uh, all information about our kingdom by myself, but my English is not so good. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask to help my friend and then my um, uh, our citizen, more active citizen, uh, Daniel Trubachov, and they uh, talk all about our citizens, <laughs> all about kingdom. <laughs> Thank you. Hello to everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much. I would be happy to, to be here. So today we would like uh, to tell a bit more about our micronation. So it's not the normal micronation because it's really big project. So it's a big project, project which can make your life uh, happier and better. So let's start. So we will start with the story of the Norbert Hunt. So uh, Kingdom of the Norbert Hunt uh, it was made eight years ago by the group of successful businessmen. So the core of the kingdom of Norbert Hunt includes successful people in different areas around the world. Uh, that's why we don't connect kingdom to any of the countries. So our kingdom is like international, it's completely virtual, and uh, we have citizens all around the world. So our ideology is very common with uh, liberalism. Liberal, uh, uh, rebel, liberal, <laughs> sorry, libertarianism. Yes. Uh, so we think that people should be free. If you are a good person with positive mindset and you want to make this world a better place, we think that uh, you don't have to be under the strict government control. That's why we already have more than 550 citizens and we already have around 2,000. Uh, 2,000 candidates to obtain our citizenship. In last 30 days, our average application quantity per day is more than 30. So that means that more and more people want to be free and more uh, and want to live in freedom, real freedom. So this is the map of our citizens. So you can see that our citizen lives around the all all the continents, in Africa, in Europe, in. Uh, in Asia, in US, everywhere. So uh, our citizens, our, some of our citizens are really famous people. So we have different sportsmen which take part in competition under our flag. We also have musicians which take part in concourses under Norberhand flag. So I can 
tell just some samples for your understanding. We have very famous musician. It's Gleb Karolov. It's a pianist in a European country, so he won a lot of lot of different prizes, uh, uh, Tchaikovsky's prizes, uh, uh, Vienna uh, um, Vienna Concert Hall prizes, and uh, now uh, he play under our flag. So we also we also have very famous chess player Sveshnikov who played the game with, Kas with Kasparov. I think you should know who is Kasparov, so it's a pretty famous chess player. And also we have a uh, very, very famous uh, traveler, Fyodor Konyukov, who did trip around the world on the, on, on the hot balloon and on the kayak. And he also has our passports. So we are like Richard Mille brand. We are very small, but we are desired. So uh, also I can tell I can tell you like a brief story about the impact of uh, this country of this uh, kingdom on my life because when I was 18 years old I I uh, just obtained this uh, citizenship and um, I was studying in medical university. So when I finished medical university, I had just idea, just to make a very revolutionary uh, pharma product which can uh, help to a lot of people with obesity, with diabetes type 2. And uh, I just go to Norberhand and uh, we discussed about this idea and uh, we really invented, we invented a real cool medical product which helped to reduce sugar cravings and normalize glucose level. And it was unbelievable because I just finished medical university and I just had an idea and uh, this kingdom helped me to, like, to set up all, all my life. Yeah, because we set up a real uh, product, real product, real successful business. So it's just more than a kingdom. We have a lot of cit citizens around the world and all of them have like different fields. They are specialists in different fields. And, um, and that means if you need the help, if you want to do something, it's very easy to do because all of our people are pretty uh, talented. They are pretty, um, they are pretty interested person. So to continue, I will tell about the main ideas of uh, the Norberhand kingdom. So this is our passports. You can check our passports uh, here on the table. So we have a uh, table with uh, our real passports. It's more like demo version because our um, real passports are even even better. So uh, Norberhand is very strong community of active people. All of our citizens are very interested in Norberhand life. Before, before COVID, we had conferences once in a month, which took place around the world in different uh, cities and different countries. And uh, it was around 150, 200 people on each conference. So we discussed about possible goals, ideas. We discussed about startups, different, um, different uh, I ideas. And uh, it was very, very helpful. But unfortunately, after COVID, we started to to do it uh, virtually. So, but let's talk about the main ideas because uh, all of our members developed two main ideas. No <laughs> borders for Norberhand citizen and no taxes. All citizens of Norberhand doesn't pay taxes already and now we are working on agreements with different countries to travel without visa in these places. We already have 12 countries around the world we discussed with about common convention of non-border zone. So all of our citizen has pretty strict verification to get a, a citizenship. If you want to become a citizen of Norberhand, you need to apply for a blue card and only after two years, if you was active, ministry can give you a citizenship. Uh, all this two-year verification means that we know all of our citizens very closely. All of citizens are enthusiastic and uh, active people who want to make life better. That's why we think that such people should have opportunity to travel free. A lot of years ago, nations didn't have borders. They had opportunity to travel with no borders. So why can't we do it? The answer is that we can, and we already can prove that we can. We think that 
if you are a successful person, you help to develop economic in each country where you travel. So it's very good for all of us. Usually people doesn't travel to the countries where it's difficult to get the visa and there are less freedom. So we see the straight line and connection between the strict government rules and successful economy. This is Norberhand attributes. So we have the flag of the kingdom. Uh, you can check it after the year. We have the passport, ID card, driving license, social security numbers. We also have an official website of the kingdom. Uh, we have our own currency, Barhand. So we have paper, currency, yeah, there are 10 Barhand and 20 Barhands. And uh, we have also um, uh, gold and sil silver coins. Also we have medals, like that. It was a present. One of our citizens present 10 medals with big real sapphire, with brilliance, with, uh, with red, uh, with red rubins, and uh, he presented it uh, to the ministry to present to people who are most engaged in uh, in everyday like activity of our of our country. So um, he, he did it because uh, one time Norbert Hunt helped him too much with his business with his project, so he made such present for us. So, the main question is how Norberhand citizenship can improve your life. So, we, why we think that citizenship of Norberhand is unique and the first one which is really helpful. If you have business, you can find anyone who you need. Yes, anyone. We have just 50 citizens and it may seem pretty little, but in fact, you can find any specialist you need. All of our citizens change their lives. All of us have very unique qualities. All of us are specialists in specific field. All of us. And that's mean that together we can make a great things. So, just some samples. I know more than 20 citizens which become millionaires after receiving the citizenship. Why? Because of very good connections. I know people who made their career with rocket ship speed. So why? Because also of the connection of our citizenships, of our citizens. I know people who traveled around 30 countries and paid nothing for living. Why? Also because of connections. So the Norberhand is a very strong community of different people, but with one main, co main connection. All of us are very enthusiastic and want to live a very good life with less restrictions, more money, more happiness, and more freedom. Also, Norberhand has a very good uh, call center, which can help you in any situation. On the border, in force major, in our country, or if you just want to let your friends more about the Norberhand, but you forgot the information about it. So, the next thing is supporting um, of businesses and startup. I talked about my story, uh, but there is a lot of cases like that. So next thing is about convention of avoidance of double taxation. Our citizenship doesn't pay taxes de facto. The Jure on the citizenships pay taxes, but government cover everything. That means that if you are a citizen of the country which has agreement with uh, Norberhand, you can pay no taxes at all. We already had such agreements with Nor Kyprus and Kosovo. Now you can join the Norberhand, but each day it becomes more and more difficult because we offer more and more with each day. So for our citizens, we provide 24/7 support line for um, support line and uh, support line which can answer all possible questions about the kingdom and citizenship. Having said that, I am welcoming you to use our call center. Everyone who want, we can provide you a free call center. You will just provide information about your kingdom, about like all the information, and um, we are ready to support your organization and private individuals in all kinds of questions. All information about your state, your citizens, and many more, we can deliver to your office, and our colleagues will professionally support you to become closer to your citizens. So, I believe that 
by uniting our effort, we will convince world countries to come with us, our citizens and friends of the states. Also, I would like to add that obtaining citizenship of Norbrahan become more and more difficult with each day. Today, I want to open your eyes and tell about secret information, because in, no in November, about Nor Norbrahan will talk very famous person. It's unbelievable what will be, because so after this campaign, get the citizenship will be very difficult or very expensive. So if you want to become a citizen, you must jump on the early train and become early member. Our, we are open to all type of the cooperation. We, with all micronations. So be with, with us or cooperate with us. And to sum up, I would like to say that we have two limited coins of five bar hand and one bar hand from 960 silver. We would like to give these two coins for winners of tomorrow bowling competition, the five bar hand for the first place and one bar hand for the second place. So thank you very much for your attention. Hi. Hi. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, in case you don't know, I am His Excellency President Kevin Blah of the Republic of Malaysia, founder, ruler, dictator, and uh, creator of our great and amazing nation. Um, so let's see, um, I've got this thing I sort of threw together at the last second. Does this have sound effects too? Because it doesn't sound like there. Uh, it, yeah, it should play. Okay. Yes! yes. yes. <laughs> That's a cool slideshow. So we're going to talk a little bit now. There, I see, I've only heard about 4,000 times today the inspiration that uh, Malasi has had on uh, other micronations. And uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the inspiration that other micronations had uh, upon Malasi. Uh, spreading as it may be. Now, so we're in a micronation like it's 1999, give or take, it's actually like 1998. But, uh, so we know that Malasi was founded originally in 1977, back then called the Grand Republic of Oldstein. That was our cool flag, I drew that myself. And I was the Prime Minister, my friend James was the King. And uh, he moved on to other projects, but I stayed with the idea of having my own country. And in 1998, uh, well, was it like more like the mid-90s? Um, you know, before that, uh, Malasi was all on paper. There, it was just, I mean, obviously there was no internet up until whenever that happened, 93, something like that. I don't know. So it was just on paper, and I had no idea that there were other micronations out there. And somewhere in the mid-90s, discovered the internet. Somewhere a little bit after that, discovered that there were uh, other micronations. And, uh, and sort of slowly worked my way into the micronation of, uh, micronation community. So we started with Boldstein, but in 1998, I changed the name to the Republic of Malaysia. How did that happen? Well, uh, well, back up a little bit. I'm rambling here. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tripping down memory lane here. I'm getting, I just turned 60 a little while ago. <laughs> You know, I'm lucky I got that far with my lifestyle. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so when I discovered or other micronations, one of the very first ones I discovered was the King of Tolosa. Pretty much everyone here has heard of Tolosa, I think. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they were sort of a powerhouse, and uh, they were definitely online before Malasia was. And I learned quite a bit uh, from Tolosa. One thing I learned is they don't really, they really do diplomacy very well. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there's some, been some comment about Malasi's uh, diplomatic policy being a little, you know, it, mm, exclusive. We don't really have uh, diplomatic relations with, with other nations. Well, Tolosa absolutely didn't. And they were definitely the, the slamming the door type. And that was back in the days of King Ben. Uh, yeah, back in the days of King Ben. Um, and he, I, I think, got himself moved on after a while. And uh, that's, that's an entirely different story. So I did learn that, but I also learned about community. And micronations, the better micronations, are actually communities. There are collections of people, like like established nations, if you will. You know, there's different layers, and Tolosa had a hyperactive, uh, you know, uh, legislative branch in many political parties, about a bazillion states, a language that no one understands, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so I learned a little bit from Tolosa, and uh, then I started to take uh, Malasia online because it became part of not those guys, these guys. The United Provinces of Utopia. Oh, I should have reversed those slides. Oh, well. The United Provinces of Utopia were kind of a little communist micronation. Rob Hart, getting Rob Hart in Pennsylvania. He, uh, he had about a million micronations, and this is the one that I sort of ran into 
uh, around 1997. So when Malasia uh, went from being Holstein to Malasia, uh, we, um, uh, I guess, joined Utopia as a province, just sort of learning my way. Is it working okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sort of learning my way there. And uh, the one thing, the one big takeaway, besides just learning how micronations work and, and also learning that they go away quickly, which is pretty much what happened with Utopia. Um, yeah, funny story, we'll come back to that. Anyway, but was chocolate chip cookie dough, because everyone knows that Molossia's currency is based on chocolate chip cookie dough. Yes, absolutely, it's delicious stuff. And Utopia, was a bunch of college kids in Pennsylvania, and they would get together for what they call cookie dough fest, which was chocolate chip cookie dough. Back when it was not safe to eat, and they would eat it raw and watch bad monster movies, and we definitely adopted that in Molossia because he doesn't like chocolate chip. And uh, of course, you know, it's like, what, that bad? Tremors and stuff. That's, that's a classic, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. So anyway, uh, but they went away. Yeah. Utopia. Uh, apparently, Rob Hart. He was it was around the Columbine thing, and uh, so he, he was part of the trench coat mafia in his local school, and that didn't end well for him. So uh, suddenly, bam! There was no more U Utopia, and Malasia was on its own. So for a little while, we were we were the People's Democratic Republic of Malasia. And uh, that was like our first like real foray, foray online. Now we can go back, right? Uh, that was good. Oh, wrong way. Oh my goodness. Read ahead. Stop. Nope. All right. That was great. Yes. Oh, boy. So, as Malasia came online, uh, one of the. Huh, what? All right, everyone just take a break for a minute. Better? All right, so uh, the Sovereign Principality of Corvinia, uh, they were actually, they were in Denmark, yep. and they were a big influence on Malasia. I learned a lot about community from them. Um, they actually had, before the days of internet, I mean, identity theft, uh, a database. On the database, you could see all of their citizens, all the way from the top, all the way down to the bottom, including pictures and so forth. I don't think people do that anymore. That's probably a bad thing. But the uh, probably the, the, the biggest um, epiphanal moment with, was with these guys in, in probably my entire micronational existence uh, because they claimed actual land on Earth. Now, up to this point, Malasia had had sort of fictional places. We had like a little newsletter, and there are such and such province with palm trees, because who doesn't love palm trees? Anyway, and, uh, and so forth like that. But they weren't actually real places, and at one point, I was talking with them back and forth, and they were like, yeah, we, we claim this island over here in, in a harbor there in, in Copenhagen, and, and we have this island out there, and I'm like, what? We actually claim real places? And that was a real moment in my brain. Sometimes I take a little while to catch up, guys. I'm sorry. But anyway, so that was a real moment in my brain, and that's when I started tying Malasia to the actual real physical place. We have obviously our house, but then by extension, for a little while, it was local places. There was a a couple of abandoned ghost towns out east of Malasia that we claimed. Probably it's a spike in the ground, it's probably still there. But anyway, but uh, uh, but it then eventually it became you know our two provinces, Farfalla and Desert Homestead, which are this land we also actually own. And it was just kind of like a big big watershed in my brain that you can actually claim real places on Earth for your for your micronation. And so they definitely had an impact. They most of these micronations you can see have actually gone away. I think Tulsa is the only one that's still around. Ironically, going back to those guys for a second, they just reached out to me for diplomatic <laughs> relations. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, the wheels have turned. <laughs> and you know what I said? We don't do that. <laughs> so I didn't slam that door in. <laughs> that was much nicer than that. Uh, anyway, so we talked about Utopia. The King of Falkenberg. Remember those guys? Yes, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yes. I think his name was Prince, I don't know, King Albrecht, something, yeah. Friedrich Albrecht, and anyway. He's actually still running around selling um, selling uh, stuff from the kingdom. Really? Yeah, I, I ran in, I ran into him online about five years ago trying to buy a coin trying to buy a coin from him. And uh, he wouldn't take PayPal, so I <laughs> didn't get to it. But he's still around. I'll be darned. Falkenberg is not around, but the king is still around. I would have really thought that he would literally not be around anymore because <laughs> I, I believe that he dropped out of the Kingdom of Falkenberg when he, because he had health problems. He did have so health that, problems. That made me assume that he was older and then thus is no longer. But it's good to know that he's still around. They were actually our first diplomatic interaction. 
excuse me, back when, when Malasia actually did engage in, in diplomacy, formal diplomacy between other nations. Also, my first knighthood. And um, I've got my phone so, I don't know. Uh, but anyway. All right, so the King of Triparia. These guys were located in Pittsburgh, uh, in the Pittsburgh area, Western Pennsylvania. And uh, they were also all college kids. And they had a really good group there. Uh, contribution, I guess, to Molossi's culture is that they their citizenship their citizenship requirement was that um, you had to then actually physically not physically well anyway personally know all of their citizens so the, no no online citizen somebody in you, you know in the far reaches of I don't know wherever and no they actually had to know everyone and that became cornerstone of how we do things in Molossi. Uh, our law, our rule is that you need to know, all, I mean, we need to know personally all of our citizens and that's evolved into Malasia being a family nation because we don't have a lot of friends. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, every, everyone in the room is your friend. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's lunch, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, now, briefly the kingdom of, Ch of Chakonia, remember these guys? No, anyway, they were actually an offshoot of of, of, of Reunion, the Holy Empire of Reunion, yep. Yep. Oh, and yeah. I think the Holy Empire of Reunion is still around in some sort level of. or another. Sort um, of. Yeah, sort of, like sort of thing. Um, Chagonia kind of weirded them out a little, little bit because as an offshoot, that, that was their, it was actually a religion based on yep. chocolate, and the, the Reunion <laughs> folks were a little conservative about religion. They're like, well, we don't know about that, but then they scaled it back. But I just put it up here because, you know, you got to do what you love, and they apparently really love chocolate. So, I mean, you know, not good for my blood sugar, so. But anyway, all right, so yes. the Free Commonwealth of Pinguinia. Okay, I love these guys. They were an offshoot of Tolosa because yep. King Ben of Tolosa was a little bit autocratic and they decided that they wanted to have their own thing. They kind of kind of broke off. And unfortunately, you can't see it anymore, but they had an absolutely hilarious message board blog thing, which was uh, Penguin Hills 90210. <laughs> and I mean, if you kind of knew some of their citizens and all the weird stuff that happened with them, it was, it was hysterical. I read it over and over again. I didn't even know these guys, but it was it was pretty funny. But again, community and yeah. community, I think, is very important uh, for uh, for micronations. So, so uh, anyway, and the King of Zara Hamla was our, our first state visit. The first state visit. One. We've actually not had too many where we went to another country, and they are actually here in Las Vegas, and uh, that was uh, oddly enough. I don't know if this is something you want to really talk about, but it seems like every time there's a state visit, someone comes to Malasia, or they go, or we go to them, their micronation goes under. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means exactly. But these guys, these guys disappeared pretty quick. I think maybe like a year or so after we came in and visited them. Uh, we did that in conjunction, by the way, with the Star Trek convention. That was pretty awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, we were oh, just talking about God. this guy this morning. That's Christopher Thieme of the Principality of Alame. Alame? Alame? Alame. Alame? Okay, anyway. Does he look like he's in jail? <laughs> yeah, that's because he's in jail. <laughs> this is a very bad guy. <laughs> he, really, he really was. As a micronationalist, he was hard to, really hard to be around. He was yep. a jerk. Oh, and yeah, a Nazi. Nazi. <laughs> oh, okay, so yeah, he didn't know that He was a devoted neo-Nazi. Oh, yeah, that, you know, that explains an awful lot. And he's actually in jail now, serving out an umpteenth terms for 17 years. 17 years for doing very bad things. It's kind of an example of what not to do. Um, <laughs> but I guess it kind of tells you, I mean, if, if the guy's a jerk online, maybe he's like a jerk in real life too. I think he tried to kidnap his girlfriend and kill her. He, he like actually that. tried to hire a hitman to kill his ex-girlfriend. Ex-girlfriend, yeah, absolutely. He, to kidnap her and then murder her after they'd held on to her for long enough for him to drain her bank accounts and sell her house so that he could pay the hitman with the proceeds. This was a year after he'd gotten out of a seven-year stretch in New Jersey's penitentiary for assaulting a woman with a pool cue and then running naked through the um, campus of Rutgers University. I knew that part. I knew that part. <laughs> but what, what you don't know is that during the Rutgers incident, right after he got arrested, he called me when I was working for the U.S. Marshals and tried to get me to get him out of the United States by telling me the FBI was after him because he was working for the mob in Philadelphia. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> he was a lunatic. He was. He was a crazy guy. He was. And he was very hard to deal with uh, just very as a micronationalist. So, uh, okay. All right, so here we are. Okay, Nova Roma. I love those guys, too. Nova Roma's pretty awesome. They, they um, I think they're still around. I they checked their website the other day. And they're kind of a, um, uh, like a, what's it called? What's it called? Is that what it's called now? Or, well, reenacting type thing. They're like Roman reenacting 
uh, type thing. And I really like that because again, it was like a real world deal. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, make your micronation as real and as real world as you possibly can. And these guys definitely do. Um, I'm not sure that Run Around Our Toga would really be my thing, but it's, you know, it works for them. And, uh, then we have Lucas Dan. I don't actually remember these guys. <laughs> Lucas Dan is, they were never in, I guess, the standard micronationalist role. Uh, apparently the guys, I don't remember what his first name is, obviously his last name is Lucas. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they won, won an island out somewhere out in the Pacific with that hand of cards right there and then proceeded to create this uh, micronation, if you will. And it's very tongue in cheek, and it taught, me a, it taught me it was okay to laugh a little bit about and with uh, your nation. For example, their great seal was literally a picture of a seal. seal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And you can see that's the card thing right there, these colors run. Their ruler was the Grand Panjandrum, and uh, not to be confused with Molossia's Great Panjandrum, which is our, you know, one of our secret wonder weapons. But anyway, go to YouTube, everyone should be going, yeah, I remember that. No? Anyway, unfortunately, uh, the Grand Panjano just recently died, which is sort of a sad fancy in the micronational world. But at, at any rate, you can still check out their website. I don't know how it's still active, but it's been literally the same for 20 years. Nothing has changed there except for, you know, right here. And those are some of the micronations that really touched on, uh, touched Molossia early on when we first came online, of course. There are many, many more. Don't mean to there's anybody in the studio audience that, that uh, you know, hey, wait a minute, what about me? Didn't we, didn't we talk about that? Once or twice? Absolutely, of course. I mean, but these, this was that, that moment when we came online to see what we could do with this micronation idea. And, uh, you know, kind of probably know what we've done since then. I don't know if you noticed in the upcountry and stuff. But anyway, I guess that's it. <laughs>